This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Winston Tharp. Five Continental Op Stories by Dashiell Hammett. Arson Plus. Jim Tarr picked up a cigar I rolled across his desk, looked at the band, bit off an end, and reached for a match. Fifteen cents straight, he said. You must want me to break a couple of laws for you this time. I had been doing business with this fat sheriff of Sacramento County for four or five years, ever since I came to the Continental Detective Agency's San Francisco office, and I had never known him to miss an opening for a sour crack, but it didn't mean anything. Wrong both times, I told him. I get two of them for a quarter, and I'm here to do you a favor instead of asking for one. The company that insured Thornburg's house thinks somebody touched it off. That's right enough, according to the fire department. They tell me the lower part of the house was soaked with gasoline, but God knows how they could tell. There wasn't a stick left standing. I've got my clump working on it, but he hasn't found anything to get excited about yet. What's the layout? All I know is that there was a fire. Tar leaned back in his chair, turned his red face to the ceiling, and bellowed. Hey, Mac! The pearl push-buttons on his desk are ornaments, so far as he is concerned. Deputy Sheriffs McHale, McClump, and Macklin came to the door together. McNabb evidently wasn't within hearing. What's the idea? The sheriff demanded of McClump. Are you carrying a bodyguard around with you? The two other deputies, thus informed as to who Mac referred to this time, went back to their cribbage game. We got a city slicker here to catch our firebug for us, Tar told his deputy. But we got to tell him what it's all about first. McClump and I had worked together on an express robbery several months before. He's a rangy, tow-headed youngster of twenty-five or six, with all the nerve in the world, and most of the laziness. Ain't the Lord good to us? He had himself draped across a chair by now, always his first objective when he comes into a room. Well, here's how she stands. This fellow Thornburg's house was a couple miles out of town on the old country road, an old frame house. About midnight, night before last, Jeff Pringle, the nearest neighbor, half a mile or so to the east, saw a glare in the sky from over that way and phoned in the alarm. But by the time the fire wagons got there, there wasn't enough of the house left to bother about. Pringle was the first of the neighbors to get to the house, and the roof had already fell in then. Nobody saw anything suspicious, no strangers hanging around or nothing. Thornburg's help just managed to save themselves, and that was all. They didn't know much about what happened, too scared, I reckon. But they did see Thornburg at his window just before the fire got him. A fellow here in town, name of Henderson, saw that part of it, too. He was driving home from Waiton and got to the house just before the roof caved in. The fire department people say they found signs of gasoline. The Coonses, Thornburg's help, say they didn't have no gas on the place. So there you are. Thornburg have any relatives? Yeah, a niece in San Francisco, a Mrs. Evelyn Trowbridge. She was up yesterday, but there was nothing she could do, and she couldn't tell us nothing much, so she went home. Where are the servants now? Here in town, staying at a hotel on I Street. I told them to stick around for a few days. Thornburg owned the house? Uh-huh. Bought it from Newland and Weed a couple of months ago. You got anything to do this morning? Nothing but this. Good. Let's go out and dig around. We found the Coonses in their room at the hotel on I Street. Mr. Coons was a small-boned, plump man with a smooth, meaningless face and the suavity of the typical male house servant. His wife was a tall, stringy woman, perhaps five years older than her husband, say forty, with a mouth and a chin that seemed shaped for gossiping. But he did all the talking, while she nodded her agreement every second or third word. We went to work for Mr. Thornburg on the 15th of June, I think, he said in reply to my first question. We came to Sacramento about the first of the month and put in applications at the Alice Employment Bureau. A couple of weeks later, they sent us out to see Mr. Thornburg, and he took us on. Where were you before you came here? In Seattle, sir, with a Mrs. Comerford. But the climate there didn't agree with my wife. She has bronchial trouble, 
so we decided to come to California. We most likely would have stayed in Seattle, though, if Mrs. Comerford hadn't given up her house. What do you know about Thornburg? Very little, sir. He wasn't a talkative gentleman. He hadn't any business that I know of. I think he was a retired seafaring man. He never said he was, but he had that manner and look. He never went out or had anybody in to see him, except his niece once, and he didn't write or get any mail. He had a room next to his bedroom fixed up as a sort of workshop. He spent most of his time in there. I always thought he was working on some sort of invention, but he kept the door locked and wouldn't let us go near it. Haven't you any idea at all what it was? No, sir. We never heard any hammering or noises from it, and never smelt anything either. And none of his clothes were ever the least bit soiled, even when they were ready to go to the laundry. They would have been if he had been working on anything like machinery. Was he an old man? He couldn't have been over fifty, sir. He was very erect, and his hair and beard were thick, with no gray hairs. Ever have any trouble with him? Oh, no, sir. He was, if I may say it, a very peculiar gentleman in a way. And he didn't care about anything except having his meals fixed right, having his clothes taken care of. He was very particular about them, and not being disturbed. Except early in the morning and at night, we'd hardly see him all day. Now, about the fire. Tell us the whole thing, everything you remember. Well, sir, I and my wife had gone to bed about ten o'clock, our regular time, and had gone to sleep. Our room was on the second floor in the rear. Some time later, I never did know exactly what time it was, I woke up coughing. The room was all full of smoke, and my wife was sort of strangling. I jumped up and dragged her down the back stairs and out the back door, not thinking of anything but getting her out of there. When I had her safe in the yard, I thought of Mr. Thornburg and tried to get back in the house, but the whole first floor was just flames. I ran around front then to see if he'd got out, but didn't see anything of him. The whole yard was as light as day by then. Then I heard him scream. A horrible scream, sir. I can hear it yet. And I looked up at his window, that was the front second-story room, and saw him there, trying to get out the window. But all the woodwork was burning, and he screamed again and fell back, and right after that the roof over his room fell in. There wasn't a ladder or anything I could have put up to the window for him. There wasn't anything I could have done. In the meantime, a gentleman had left his automobile in the road and come up to where I was standing. But there wasn't anything we could do. The house was burning everywhere and falling in here and there. So we went back to where I had left my wife and carried her father away from the fire and brought her to. She had fainted. And that's all I know about it, sir. Hear any noises earlier that night or see anybody hanging around? No, sir. Have any gasoline around the place? No, sir. Mr. Thornburg didn't have a car. No gasoline for cleaning? No, sir. None at all. Unless Mr. Thornburg had it in his workshop, when his clothes needed cleaning, I took them to town, and all his laundry was taken by the grocer's man when he brought our provisions. Don't know anything that might have some bearing on the fire? No, sir. I was surprised when I heard that somebody had set the house afire. I could hardly believe it. I don't know why anybody should want to do that. What do you think of them? I asked McClump as we left the hotel. They might pad the bills, or even go south with some of the silver. But they don't figure as killers in my mind. That was my opinion, too. But they were the only persons known to have been there when the fire started, except the man who had died. We went around to the Alice Employment Bureau and talked to the manager. He told us that the Coonses had come to his office on June 2nd, looking for work, and had given Mrs. Edward Comerford, 45 Woodmansey Terrace, Seattle, Washington, as reference. In reply to a letter, he always checked up the references of servants, Mrs. Comerford had written that the Coonses had been in her employ for a number of years and had been extremely satisfactory in every respect. On June 13th, Thornburg had telephoned the Bureau asking that a man and his wife be sent out to keep house for him, and Alice had sent two couples that he had listed. Neither had been employed by Thornburg, though Alice considered them more desirable than the Coonses, who were finally hired by Thornburg. All that would certainly seem to indicate that the Coonses hadn't deliberately maneuvered themselves into the place, 
unless they were the luckiest people in the world, and a detective can't afford to believe in luck or coincidence unless he has unquestionable proof of it. At the office of the real estate agents through whom Thornburg had bought the house, Newling and Weed, we were told that Thornburg had come in on the 11th of June and had said he had been told the house was for sale, had looked it over, and wanted to know the price. The deal had been closed the next morning, and he had paid for the house with a check for $4,500 on the Siemens Bank of San Francisco. The house was already furnished. After luncheon, McClump and I called on Howard Henderson, the man who had seen the fire while driving home from Wayton. He had an office in the Empire Building with his name and the title Northern California Agent Instant Sheen Cleanser Company on the door. He was a big, careless-looking man of 45 or so with a professionally jovial smile that belongs to the salesman. He had been in Wayton on business the day of the fire, he said, and had stayed there until rather late, going to dinner and afterward playing pool with a grocer named Hammersmith, one of his customers. He had left Wayton in his machine about 10.30 and set out for Sacramento. At Tavender, he had stopped at the garage for oil and gas and to have one of his tires blown up. Just as he was about to leave the garage, the garage man had called his attention to a red glare in the sky and had told him that it was probably from a fire somewhere along the old county road that paralleled the state road into Sacramento. So Henderson had taken the county road and had arrived at the burning house just in time to see Thornburg try to fight his way through the flames that enveloped him. It was way too late to make any attempt to put out the fire, and the man upstairs was beyond saving by then, undoubtedly dead even before the roof collapsed. So Henderson had helped Coons revive his wife and stayed there watching the fire until it had burned itself out. He had seen no one on the county road while driving to the fire. "'What do you know about Henderson?' I asked McClump when we were on the street. "'Came here from somewhere in the east, I think, early in the summer to open that cleanser agency. Lives at the Garden Hotel. Where do we go next? We get a machine and take a look at what's left of the Thornburg house. An enterprising incendiary couldn't have found a lovelier spot in which to turn himself loose if he looked the whole county over. Tree-topped hills hid it from the rest of the world on three sides, while away from the fourth an uninhabited plain rolled down to the river. The county road that passed the front gate was shunned by automobiles, so McClump said, in favor of the state highway to the north. Where the house had been was now a mound of blackened ruins. We poked around in the ashes for a few minutes, not that we expected to find anything, but because it's in the nature of man to poke around in ruins. A garage in the rear, whose interior gave no evidence of recent occupation, had a badly scorched roof and front, what was otherwise undamaged. A shed behind it, sheltering an axe, a shovel, and various odds and ends of gardening tools, had escaped the fire altogether. The lawn in front of the house and the garden behind the shed, about an acre in all, had been pretty thoroughly cut and trampled by wagon wheels and the feet of the firemen and the spectators. Having ruined our shoe shines, McClump and I got back in our machine and swung off in a circle around the place, calling at all the houses within a mile radius and getting little besides jolts for our trouble. The nearest house was that of Pringle, the man who had turned in the alarm. But he not only knew nothing about the dead man, but said he had never seen him. In fact, only one of the neighbors had ever seen him, a Mrs. Jabin, who lived about a mile to the south. She had taken care of the key to the house while it was vacant, and a day or two before he bought it, Thornburg had come to her house inquiring about the vacant one. She had gone over there with him and showed him through it, and he had told her that he intended buying it if the price, of which neither of them knew anything, wasn't too high. He had been alone, except for the chauffeur of the hired car in which he had come from Sacramento, and save that he had no family, he had told her nothing about himself. Hearing that he had moved in, she went over to call on him several days later, just a neighborly visit, but had been told by Mrs. Coons that he was not at home. Most of the neighbors had talked to the Coonses and had got the impression that Thornburg did not care for visitors, so they had let him alone. The Coonses were described as pleasant enough to talk to when you meet them, but reflecting their employer's desire not to make friends. McClump summarized what the afternoon had taught us as we pointed our machine toward Tavender. Any of these folks could have touched off the place, but we got nothing to show that any of them even knew Thornburg, let alone had a bone to pick with him. 
Tavender turned out to be a crossroads settlement of a general store and post office, a garage, a church, and six dwellings, about two miles from Thornburg's place. McClump knew the storekeeper and postmaster, a scrawny little man named Philo, who stuttered moistly. I never thought Thornburg, he said, and I never had any mail for him. Cocoons, it sounded like one of those things butterflies come out, used to come in once a week to, to order groceries. They d didn't have a phone. He used to walk in, and I'd send the stuff over in my car. The, then I, I'd s see him once in a while, waiting for, for the stage to s Sacramento, who drove the stuff out to Thornburg's. M m my boy, boy, want to talk, talk to him? The boy was the juvenile edition of the old man, but without the stutter. He had never seen Thornburg on any of his visits, but his business had taken him only as far as the kitchen. He hadn't noticed anything peculiar about the place. Who's the night man at the garage? I asked him after we had listened to the little he had to tell. Billy Luce. I think you can catch him there now. I saw him go in a few minutes ago. We crossed the road and found Luce. Night before last, the night of the fire down the road, was there a man here talking to you when you first saw it? He turned his eyes upward in that vacant stare which people use to aid their memory. Yes, I remember now. He was going to town, and I told him that if he took the county road instead of the state road, he'd see the fire on his way in. What kind of looking man was he? Middle-aged? A big man, but sort of slouchy. I think he had on a brown suit, baggy and wrinkled. Medium complexion? Yes. Smile when he talked? Yes. A pleasant sort of fellow. Curly brown hair? Have a heart, Luce laughed. I didn't put him under a magnifying glass. From Tavender we drove over to Waiton. Luce's description had fit Henderson all right. But while we were at it we thought we might as well check up to make sure that he had been coming from Waiton. We spent exactly twenty-five minutes in Waiton, ten of them finding Hammersmith, the grocer with whom Henderson had said he dined and played pool, five minutes finding the proprietor of the pool room, and ten verifying Henderson's story. What do you think of it now, Mac? I asked as we rolled back towards Sacramento. Mac's too lazy to express an opinion or even form one, unless he's driven to it, but that doesn't mean they aren't worth listening to, if you can get them. There ain't a hell of a lot to think, he said cheerfully. Henderson is out of it, if he ever was in it. There's nothing to show that anybody but the Coonses and Kornberg were there when the fire started, but they may have been a regiment there. Them Coonses ain't too honest-looking, maybe, but they ain't killers, or I miss my guess. But the fact remains that they're the only bet we got so far. Maybe we ought to try to get a line on them. All right, I agreed. I'll get a wire off to our Seattle office asking them to interview Mrs. Comerford and see what she can tell about them as soon as we get back in town. Then I'm going to catch a train for San Francisco and see Thornburg's niece in the morning. Next morning, at the address McClump had given me, a rather elaborate apartment building on California Street, I had to wait three quarters of an hour for Mrs. Evelyn Trowbridge to dress. If I had been younger, or a social caller, I suppose I'd have felt amply rewarded when she finally came in, a tall, slender woman of less than thirty, in some sort of clinging black affair, with a lot of black hair over a very white face, strikingly set off by a small red mouth and big hazel eyes that looked black until you got close to them. But I was a busy, middle-aged detective, who was fuming over having his time wasted, and I was a lot more interested in finding the bird who struck the match than I was in feminine beauty. However, I smothered my grouch, apologized for disturbing her at such an early hour, and got down to business. I want you to tell me all you know about your uncle. His family, friends, enemies, business connections, everything. I had scribbled on the back of the card I had sent into her what my business was. He hasn't any family, she said, unless I might be it. He was my mother's brother, and I am the only one of the family now living. Where was he born? Here in San Francisco. I don't know the date, but he was about fifty years old, I think. Three years older than my mother. What was his business? He went to sea when he was a boy, 
and so far as I know, always followed it until a few months ago. Captain? I don't know. Sometimes I wouldn't see or hear from him for several years, and he never talked about what he was doing, although he would have mentioned some of the places he had visited. Rio de Janeiro, Madagascar, Tobago, Cristiana. Then about three months ago, sometime in May, he came here and told me that he was through with wandering, that he was going to take a house in some quiet place where he could work undisturbed on an invention in which he was interested. He lived at the Francisco Hotel while he was in San Francisco. After a couple of weeks, he suddenly disappeared. And then, about a month ago, I received a telegram from him asking me to come to see him at his house near Sacramento. I went up the very next day, and I thought that he was acting very queerly. He seemed very excited over something. He gave me a will that he had just drawn up and some life insurance policies in which I was beneficiary. Immediately after that he insisted that I return home, and hinted rather plainly that he did not wish me to either visit him again or write until I heard from him. I thought all that rather peculiar, as he had always seemed fond of me. I never saw him again. What was this invention he was working on? I really don't know. I asked him once, but he became so excited, even suspicious, that I changed the subject and never mentioned it again. Are you sure that he really did follow the sea all those years? No, I am not. I just took it for granted. But he may have been doing something altogether different. Was he ever married? Not that I know of. Know any of his friends or enemies? No, none. Remember anybody's name that he ever mentioned? No. I don't want you to think this next question insulting, though I admit it is. But it has to be asked. Where were you the night of the fire? At home. I had some friends here to dinner, and they stayed until about midnight. Mr. and Mrs. Walter Kellogg, Mrs. John Dupree, and a Mr. Kilmer, who was a lawyer. I can give you their addresses, or you can get them from the phone book if you want to question them. From Mrs. Trowbridge's apartment, I went to the Francisco Hotel. Thornburg had been registered there from May 10th to June 13th, and hadn't attracted much attention. He had been a tall, broad-shouldered, erect man of about fifty, with rather long brown hair brushed straight back, a short, pointed brown beard, and healthy, ruddy complexion. Grave, quiet, punctilious in dress and manner, his hours had been regular, and he had had no visitors that any of the hotel employees remembered. At the seaman's bank, upon which Thornburg's check and payment of the house had been drawn, I was told that he had opened an account there on May 15th, having been introduced by W. W. Jeffers and Sons, local stockbrokers. A balance of little more than $400 remained to his credit. The canceled checks on hand were all to the order of various life insurance companies, and for amounts that if they represented premiums testified to rather large policies. I jotted down the names of the life insurance companies, and then went to the offices of W. W. Jeffers and Sons. Thornburg had come in, I was told, on the 10th of May with $4,000 worth of Liberty Bonds that he wanted sold. During one of his conversations with Jeffers, he had asked the broker to recommend a bank, and Jeffers had given him a letter of introduction to the Siemens Bank. That was all Jeffers knew about him. He gave me the numbers of the bonds, but tracing Liberty Bonds isn't the easiest thing in the world. The reply to my Seattle telegram was waiting for me at the agency when I arrived. Mrs. Edward Comerford rented apartment at address you give on May 25. Gave it up June 6. Trunks to San Francisco, same day. Check numbers GN452, 587, and 8, and 9. Tracing baggage is no trick at all, if you have the dates and check numbers to start with, as many a bird who was wearing somewhat similar numbers on his chest and back, because he overlooked that detail when making his getaway, can tell you and twenty-five minutes in a baggage room at the ferry and half an hour in the office of a transfer company gave me my answer. The trunks had been delivered to Mrs. Evelyn Trowbridge's apartment. I got Jim Tarr on the phone and told him about it. "'Good shooting,' he said, forgetting for once to indulge his wit. "'We'll grab the Coonses here, and Mrs. Trowbridge there, and that's the end of another mystery.' "'Wait a minute,' I cautioned him. "'It's not all straightened out yet. There are still a few kinks in the plot.' It's straight enough for me. I'm satisfied. You're the boss. 
but I think you're being a little hasty. I'm going up to talk with the niece again. Give me a little time before you phone the police here to make the pinch. I'll hold her till they get there. Evelyn Trowbridge let me in this time, instead of the maid who had opened the door for me in the morning, and she led me to the same room in which we had had our first talk. I let her pick out a seat, and then I selected one that was closer to either door than hers was. On the way up I had planned a lot of innocent-sounding questions that would get her all snarled up. But after taking a good look at this woman sitting in front of me, leaning comfortably back in her chair, coolly waiting for me to speak my piece, I discarded the trick stuff and came out cold turkey. Ever use the name Mrs. Edward Comerford? Oh, yes. As casual as a nod on the street. When? Often. You see, I happen to have been married not so long ago to Mr. Edward Comerford, so it's not really strange that I should have used the name. Use it in Seattle recently? I would suggest, she said sweetly, that if you are leading up to the references I gave Coons and his wife, you might save time by coming right to it. That's fair enough, I said. Let's do that. There wasn't a half-tone, a shading in voice, manner, or expression to indicate that she was talking about anything half so serious or important to her as the possibility of being charged with murder. She might have been talking about the weather or a book that hadn't interested her particularly. During the time that Mr. Comerford and I were married, we lived in Seattle, where he still lives. After the divorce, I left Seattle and resumed my maiden name. And the Coonses were in our employ, as you might learn if you care to look it up. You'll find my husband, or former husband, at the Chelsea Apartments, I think. Last summer, or late spring, I decided to return to Seattle. The truth of it is, I suppose all my personal affairs will be aired anyhow, that I thought perhaps Edward and I might patch up our differences. So I went back and took an apartment on Woodmancy Terrace. As I was known in Seattle as Mrs. Edward Comerford, and as I thought using his name might influence him a little, perhaps, I used it while I was there. Also, I telephoned the Coonses to make tentative arrangements in case Edward and I should open our house again. But Coons told me they were going to California, and so I gladly gave them an excellent recommendation when some days later I received a letter of inquiry from an employment bureau in Sacramento. After I had been in Seattle for about two weeks, I changed my mind about the reconciliation. Edward's interest, I learned, was all centered elsewhere. So I returned to San Francisco. Very nice, but if you will permit me to finish, she interrupted, when I went to see my uncle in response to his telegram, I was surprised to find the Coonses in his house. Knowing my uncle's peculiarities and finding them now increased, and remembering his extreme secretiveness about his mysterious invention, I cautioned the Coonses not to tell him that they had been in my employ. He certainly would have discharged them, and just as certainly would have quarreled with me. He would have thought that I was having him spied upon. Then when Coons telephoned me after the fire, I knew that to admit the Coonses had been formerly in my employ would, in view of the fact that I was my uncle's heir, cast suspicion on all three of us. So we foolishly agreed to say nothing about it and carry on the deception. That didn't sound all wrong, but it didn't sound all right. I wish Tar had taken it easier and let us get a better line on these people before having them thrown in the coop. The coincidence of the Coonses stumbling into my uncle's house is, I fancy, too much for your detecting instincts, she went on as I didn't say anything. Am I to consider myself under arrest? I'm beginning to like this girl. She's a nice, cool piece of work. Not yet, I told her, but I'm afraid it's going to happen pretty soon. She smiled a little mocking smile at that, and another when the doorbell rang. It was O'Hara from police headquarters. We turned the apartment upside down and inside out, but didn't find anything of importance except the will she had told me about, dated July 8th, and her uncle's life insurance policies. They were all dated between May 15th and June 10th, and added up to a little more than $200,000. I spent an hour grilling the maid after O'Hara had taken Evelyn Trowbridge away, but she didn't know any more than I did. However, between her, the janitor, the manager of the apartments, and the names Mrs. Trowbridge had given me, I learned that she had really been entertaining friends on the night of the fire, until after 11 o'clock anyway, and that was late enough. 
Half an hour later, I was riding the short line back to Sacramento. I was getting to be one of the line's best customers, and my anatomy was on bouncing terms with every bump in the road. And the bumps, as Rubberhead Davis used to say about the flies and mosquitoes in Alberta in summer, is freely plentiful. Between bumps, I tried to fit the pieces of the Thornburg puzzle together. The Nice and the Coonses fit in somewhere, but not just where we had them. We had been working on the job sort of lopsided, but it was the best we could do with it. In the beginning, we had turned to the Coonses and Evelyn Trowbridge because there was no other direction to go. And now we had something on them, but a good lawyer could make hash of our case against them. The Coonses were in the county jail when I got to Sacramento. After some questioning, they had admitted their connection with the niece and had come through with stories that matched hers in every detail. Tar McClump and I sat around the sheriff's desk and argued. Those yarns are pipe dreams, the sheriff said. We got all three of them cold, and there's nothing else to it. They're as good as convicted of murder. McClump grinned derisively at his superior and then turned to me. Go on. You tell him about the holes in this little case. He ain't your boss. Can't take it out on you later for being smarter than he is. Tar glared from one of us to the other. Spill it, you wise guys, he ordered. Our dope is, I told him, figuring that McClump's view of it was the same as mine, that there's nothing to show that even Thornburg knew he was going to buy that house before the 10th of June, and that the Coonses were in town looking for work on the 2nd. And besides, it was only by luck that they got the jobs. The employment agency sent two couples out there ahead of them. We'll take a chance on letting the jury figure that out. Yes? You'll also take a chance on them figuring out that Thornburg, who seems to have been a nut all right, might have touched off the place himself. We've got something on these people, Jim, but not enough to go into court with them. How are you going to prove that when the Coonses were planted in Thornburg's house, if you can even prove they were, they and the Trowbridge woman knew he was going to load up with insurance policies? The sheriff spat disgustedly. You guys are the limit. You run around in circles, digging up the dope on these people until you got enough to hang them, and then you run around hunting for outs. What the hell's the matter with you now? I answered him from halfway to the door. The pieces were beginning to fit together under my skull. Going to run some more circles. Come on, Mac. McClump and I held a conference on the fly, and then I got a machine from the nearest garage and headed for Tavender. We made time going out and got there before the general store was closed for the night. The stuttering Philo separated himself from the two men with whom he had been talking, Hiram Johnson, and followed me to the rear of the store. Do you keep an itemized list of the laundry you handle? N no, no, just the amount. Let's look at Thornburg's. He produced a begrimed and rumpled account book, and we picked out the weekly items I wanted. 260, 310, 225, and so on. Got the last batch of laundry here? Y yes, he said. It, it just ca ca came out from the city to today. I tore open the bundle. Some sheets, pillowcases, tablecloths, towels, napkins, some feminine clothing, some shirts, collars, underwear, socks that were unmistakably Coons's. I thanked Philo while running back to my machine. Back in Sacramento again, McClump was waiting for me at the garage where I had hired the car. Registered at the hotel on June 15th, rented the office on the 16th. I think he's in the hotel now, he greeted me. We hurried around the block to the Garden Hotel. Mr. Henderson went out a minute or two ago, the night clerk told us. He seemed to be in a hurry. Know where he keeps his car? In the hotel garage around the corner. We were within two pavements of the garage when Henderson's automobile shot out and turned up the street. Oh, Mr. Henderson, I cried, trying to keep my voice level and smooth. He stepped on the gas and streaked away from us. Want him? A clump asked, and at my nod, stopped a passing roadster by the simple expedient of stepping out in front of it. We climbed aboard. McClump flashed his star at the bewildered driver and pointed out Henderson's dwindling tail light. After he had persuaded himself that he wasn't being boarded by a couple of bandits, the commandeered driver did his best, and we picked up Henderson's tail light after two or three turnings and closed in on him, though his machine was going at a good clip. By the time we reached the outskirts of the city, we had crawled up to within safe shooting distance, and I sent a bullet over the fleeting man's head. Thus encouraged, he managed to get a little more speed out of his car, but we were definitely overhauling him now. 
Just at the wrong minute, Henderson decided to look over his shoulder at us. An unevenness in the road twisted his wheels, his machine swayed, skidded, went over on its side. Almost immediately from the heart of the tangle came a flash and a bullet moan past my ear. Another. And then, while I was still hunting for something to shoot at in the pile of junk we were drawing down upon, McClump's ancient and battered revolver roared in my other ear. Henderson was dead when we got to him. McClump's bullet had taken him over one eye. McClump spoke to me over the body. I ain't an inquisitive sort of fellow, but I sure hope you don't mind telling me why I shot this lad. Because he was Thornburg. He didn't say anything for about five minutes. Then, I reckon that's right. How'd you guess it? We were sitting beside the wreckage now, waiting for the police that we had sent our commandeered chauffeur to phone for. He had to be, I said, when you think it all over. Funny we didn't hit on it before. All that stuff we were told about Thornburg had a fishy sound. Whiskers and an unknown profession, immaculate and working on a mysterious invention, very secretive and born in San Francisco, where the fire wiped out all the old records, just the sort of fake that could be cooked up easily. Then nobody but the Coonses, Evelyn Trowbridge, and Henderson ever saw him, except between the 10th of May and the middle of June, when he bought the house. The Coonses and the Trowbridge woman were tied up together in this affair somehow, we knew. So that left only Henderson to consider. You had told me he came to Sacramento sometime early this summer, and the dates you got tonight show that he didn't come until after Thornburg had bought his house. All right. Now compare Henderson with the descriptions we got of Thornburg. Both are about the same size and age, with the same color hair. The differences are all things that can be manufactured. Clothes, a little sunburn, and a month's growth of beard, along with a little acting, would do the trick. Tonight I went out to Tavender and took a look at the last batch of laundry, and there wasn't any that didn't fit the Coonses, and none of the bills all the way back were large enough for Thornburg to have been as careful about his clothes as we were told he was. It must be great to be a detective, McClump grinned as the police ambulance came and began disgorging policemen. I reckon somebody must have tipped Hanerson off that I was asking about him this evening. And then, regretfully, So we ain't gonna hang them folks for murder, after all. No, but we oughtn't to have any trouble convicting them of arson plus conspiracy to defraud and anything else that the prosecuting attorney can think up. Crooked Souls Harvey Gatewood had issued orders that I was to be admitted as soon as I arrived, so it only took me a little less than fifteen minutes to thread my way past the doorkeepers, office boys, and secretaries who filled up most of the space between the Gatewood Lumber Corporation's front door and the President's private office. His office was large, all mahogany and bronze and green plush, with a mahogany desk as big as a bed in the center of the floor. Gatewood, leaning across the desk, began to bark at me as soon as the obsequious clerk who had bowed me in bowed himself out. "'My daughter was kidnapped last night. I want the blank that did it if it takes every cent I got.' "'Tell me about it,' I suggested, drawing up the chair that he hadn't thought to offer me. But he wanted results, it seemed, and not questions, and so I wasted nearly an hour getting information that he could have given me in fifteen minutes.' He's a big bruiser of a man, something over two hundred pounds of hard red flesh, and a czar from the top of his bullet head to the toes of his shoes that would have been at least number twelves if they hadn't been made to measure. He had made his several millions by sandbagging everybody that stood in his way, and the rage that he's burning up with now doesn't make him any easier to deal with. His wicked jaws sticking out like a knob of granite, and his eyes are filmed with blood, He's in a lovely frame of mind. For a while it looks as if the Continental Detective Agency is going to lose a client, because I've made up my mind that he's going to tell me all I want to know, or I'm going to chuck up the job. But finally I got the story out of him. His daughter, Audrey, had left their house on Clay Street at about seven o'clock the preceding evening, telling her maid that she was going out for a walk. She had not returned that night though Gatewood had not known that until after he had read the letter that came this morning. The letter had been from someone who said that she had been kidnapped. It demanded $50,000 for her release, and instructed Gatewood to get the money ready in hundred-dollar bills, 
so that there might be no delay when he is told in what manner it is to be paid over to his daughter's captors. As proof that the demand was not a hoax, a lock of the girl's hair, a ring she always wore, and a brief note from her, asking her father to comply with the demands, had been enclosed. Gatewood had received the letter at his office, and had telephoned to his house immediately. He had been told that the girl's bed had not been slept in the previous night, and that none of the servants had seen her since she started out for her walk. He had then notified the police, turning the letter over to them, and a few minutes later he had decided to employ private detectives also. Now, he burst out, after I had wormed these things out of him, and he had told me that he knew nothing of his daughter's associates or habits, go ahead and do something. I'm not paying you to sit around and talk about it. What are you going to do? I asked. Me? I'm going to put those blanks behind the bars if it takes every cent I've got in the world. Sure. But first you can get that fifty thousand ready so that you can give it to them when they ask you for it. He clicked his jaw shut, thrust his face into mine. I've never been clubbed into doing anything in my life, and I'm too old to start now, he said. I'm going to call these people's bluff. That's going to make it lovely for your daughter. But aside from what it'll do to her, it's the wrong play. Fifty thousand isn't a whole lot to you, and paying it over will give us two chances that we haven't got now. One, when the payment is made, a chance to either nab whoever comes for it or get a line on them, and the other, when your daughter is returned. No matter how careful they are, it's a cinch that she'll be able to tell us something that will help us grab them. He shook his head angrily, and I was tired of arguing with him, so I left him, hoping that he'd see the wisdom of the course I had advised before too late. At the Gatewood residence I found butlers, second men, chauffeurs, cooks, maids, upstairs girls, downstairs girls, and a raft of miscellaneous flunkies. He had enough servants to run a hotel. What they told me amounted to this. The girl had not received a phone call, note by messenger or telegram, the time-honored devices for luring a victim out to a murder or abduction, before she left the house. She had told her maid that she would be back within an hour or two, but the maid had not been alarmed when her mistress failed to return all that night. Audrey was the only child, and since her mother's death she had come and gone to suit herself. She and her father didn't hit it off very well together. Their natures were too much alike, I gathered, and he never knew where she was and there was nothing unusual about her remaining away all night, as she seldom bothered to leave word when she was going to stay overnight with friends. She was nineteen years old, but looked several years older, about five feet five inches tall and slender. She had blue eyes, brown hair, very thick and long, was pale and very nervous. Her photographs, of which I took a handful, showed that her eyes were large, her nose small and regular, and her chin obstinately pointed. She was not beautiful, but in the one photograph where a smile had wiped off the sullenness of her mouth, she was at least pretty. When she left the house she had worn a light tweed skirt and a jacket with London tailor's labels in them, a buff silk shirtwaist with stripes a shade darker, brown wool stockings, low-heeled brown oxfords, and an untrimmed gray felt hat. I went up to her rooms, she had three on the third floor, and looked through all her stuff. I found nearly a bushel of photographs of men, boys, and girls, and a great stack of letters of varying degrees of intimacy, signed with a wide assortment of names and nicknames. I made notes of all the addresses I found. Nothing there seemed to have any bearing on her abduction, but there was a chance that one of the names and addresses might be of someone who had served as a decoy, also, some of her friends might be able to tell us something of value. I dropped in at the agency and distributed the names and addresses among the three operatives who were idle, sending them out to see what they could dig up. Then I reached the police detectives who were working on the case, Agar and Thode, by telephone, and went down to the Hall of Justice to meet them. Lusk, a post office inspector, was also there. We turned the job around and around, looking at it from every angle, but not getting very far. We were all agreed, however, that we couldn't take a chance on any publicity or work in the open until the girl was safe. They had had a worse time with Gatewood than I, 
He had wanted to put the whole thing in the newspapers with the offer of a reward, photographs and all. Of course, Gatewood was right in claiming that this was the most effective way of catching the kidnappers, but it would have been tough on his daughter if her captors happened to be persons of sufficiently hardened character, and kidnappers, as a rule, aren't lambs. I looked at the letter they had sent. It was printed with pencil on ruled paper of the kind that is sold in pads by every stationary dealer in the world. The envelope was just as common, also addressed in pencil, and postmarked San Francisco, September 20, 9 p.m. That was the night she had been seized. The letter reads, Sir, we have your charming daughter and place a value of $50,000 upon her. You will get the money ready in $100 bills at once, so that there will be no delay when we tell you how it is to be paid over to us. We beg to assure you that things will go badly with your daughter should you not do as you are told, or should you bring the police into this matter, or should you do anything foolish. Fifty thousand dollars is only a small fraction of what you stole while we were living in mud and blood in France for you, and we mean to get that much or blank. 3. A peculiar note in several ways. They are usually written with a great pretense of partial illiterateness. Almost always there is an attempt to lead suspicion astray. Perhaps the ex-service stuff was there for that purpose, or perhaps not. Then there was the postscript. We know a Chinaman who will buy her even after we are through with her, in case you won't listen to reason. The letter from the girl was written jerkily on the same kind of paper, apparently with the same pencil. Daddy, please do as they ask. I am so afraid. Audrey. A door at the other end of the room opened and a head came through. Agar, Thode, Gatewood just called up. Got up to his office right away. The four of us tumbled out of the Hall of Justice and into a machine. Gatewood was pacing his office like a maniac when we pushed aside enough hirelings to get to him. His face was hot with blood and his eyes had an insane glare in them. She just phoned me, he cried thickly when he saw us. It took a minute or two to get him calm enough to tell us about it. She called me on the phone, said, Oh, Daddy, do something. I can't stand this. They're killing me. I asked her if she knew where she was, and she said, No, but I can see Twin Peaks from here. There's three men and a woman, and... And then I heard a man curse, and a sound as if he had struck her, and the phone went dead. I tried to get Central to give me the number, but she couldn't. It's a damned outrage the way the telephone system is run. We pay enough for service, God knows, and we... Ogar scratched his head and turned away from Gatewood. In sight of Twin Peaks. There are hundreds of houses that are. Gatewood, meanwhile, had finished denouncing the telephone company and was pounding on his desk with a paperweight to attract our attention. Have you people done anything at all? he demanded. I answered him with another question. Have you got the money ready? No, he said. I won't be held up by anybody. But he said it mechanically, without his usual conviction. The talk with his daughter had shaken him out of some of his stubbornness. He was thinking of her safety a little now, instead of altogether of his own fighting spirit. We went at him hammer and tongs for a few minutes, and after a while he sent a clerk out for the money. We split up the field then. Thode was to take some men from headquarters and see what he could find in the Twin Peaks end of town but we weren't very optimistic over the prospects there. The territory was too large. Lusk and Ogar were to carefully mark the bills that the clerk brought from the bank and then stick as close to Gatewood as they could get without attracting attention. I was to go out to Gatewood's house and stay there. The abductors had plainly instructed Gatewood to get the money ready immediately so that they could arrange to get it on short notice, not giving him time to communicate with anyone or make any plans. Gatewood was to get hold of the newspapers, give them the whole story with the $10,000 reward he was offering for the abductor's capture to be published as soon as the girl was safe, so that we would get the help of publicity at the earliest possible moment without jeopardizing the girl. The police and all the neighboring towns had already been notified. That had been done before the girl's phone message had assured us that she was held in San Francisco. Nothing happened at the Gatewood residence all that evening. Harvey Gatewood came home early, 
and after dinner he paced his library floor and drank whiskey until bedtime, demanding every few minutes that we, the detectives in the case, do something besides sit around like a lot of damned mummies. Ogar, Lusk, and Thode were out in the street, keeping an eye on the house and neighborhood. At midnight, Harvey Gatewood went to bed. I declined to bed in favor of the library couch, which I dragged over beside the telephone, an extension of which was in Gatewood's bedroom. At 2.30 the bell rang. I listened in while Gatewood talked from his bed. A man's voice, crisp and curt. Gatewood? Yes. Got the dough? Yes. Gatewood's voice was thick and blurred. I could imagine the boiling that was going on inside him. Good, came the brisk voice. Put a piece of paper around it and leave the house with it right away. Walk down Clay Street, keeping on the same side as your house. Don't walk too fast and keep walking. If everything's all right and there's no elbows tagging along, somebody will come up to you between your house and the waterfront. They'll have a handkerchief up to their face for a second and then they'll let it fall to the ground. When you see that, you'll lay the money on the pavement, turn around, and walk back to your house. If the money isn't marked, and you don't try any fancy tricks, you'll get your daughter back in an hour or two. If you try to pull anything, remember what we wrote you about the chink. Got it straight? Gatewood spluttered something that was meant for an affirmative, and the telephone clicked silent. I didn't waste any of my precious time tracing the call. It would be from a public telephone on you, but yelled up the stairs to Gatewood. You do as you are told, and don't try any foolishness. Then I ran out into the early morning air to find the police detectives and the post office inspector. They had been joined by two plainclothes men and had two automobiles waiting. I told them what the situation was, and we laid hurried plans. Ogar was to drive in one of the machines down Sacramento Street, and Thode and the other down Washington Street. These streets parallel clay, one on each side. They were to drive slowly, keeping pace with Gatewood, and stopping at each cross street to see that he passed. When he failed to cross within a reasonable time, they were to turn up to Clay Street, and their actions from then on would have to be guided by chance and their own wits. Lusk was to wander along a block or two ahead of Gatewood, on the opposite side of the street, pretending to be mildly intoxicated, and keeping his eyes and ears open. I was to shadow Gatewood down the street, with one of the plainclothes men behind me. The other plainclothes man was to turn in a call at headquarters for every available man to be sent to Clay Street. They would arrive too late, of course, and as likely as not it would take them some time to find us, but we had no way of knowing what was going to turn up before the night was over. Our plan was sketchy enough, but it was the best we could do. We were afraid to grab whoever got the money from Gatewood. The girl's talk with her father that afternoon had sounded too much as if her captors were desperate for us to take any chances on going after them roughshod until she was out of their hands. We had hardly finished our plans when Gatewood, wearing a heavy overcoat, left his house and turned down the street. Farther down, Lusk, weaving along, talking to himself, was almost invisible in the shadows. There was no one else in sight. That meant I had to give Gatewood at least two blocks lead so that the man who came for the money wouldn't tumble to me. One of the plainclothes men was half a block behind me, on the other side of the street. Two blocks down we walked, and then a little chunky man in a derby hat came into sight. He passed Gatewood, passed me, went on. Three blocks more. A touring car, large, black, powerfully engined, and with lowered curtains, came from the rear, passed us, and went on. Possibly a scout. I scrawled its license number down on my pad without taking my hand out of my overcoat pocket. Another three blocks. A policeman passed, strolling along in ignorance of the game being played under his nose, and then a taxicab with a single male passenger. I wrote down its license number. Four blocks with no one in sight ahead of me but Gatewood. I couldn't see Lusk any more. Just ahead of Gatewood, a man stepped out of a black doorway, turned around, called up to a window for someone to come down and open the door for him. We went on. Coming from nowhere, a woman stood on the sidewalk fifty feet ahead of Gatewood, a handkerchief to her face. It fluttered to the pavement. Gatewood stopped, standing stiff-legged. I could see his right hand come up, lifting the side of the overcoat in which it was pocketed, and I knew the hand was gripped around a pistol. For perhaps half a minute he stood like a statue. 
Then his left hand came out of his pocket, and the bundle of money fell to the sidewalk in front of him, where it made a slight blur in the darkness. Gatewood turned abruptly and began to retrace his steps homeward. The woman had recovered her handkerchief. Now she ran to the bundle, picked it up, and scuttled to the black mouth of an alley a few feet distant, a rather tall woman, bent and in dark clothes from head to feet. In the black mouth of the alley she vanished. I had been compelled to slow up while Gatewood and the woman stood facing each other, and I was more than a block away now. As soon as the woman disappeared I took a chance and started pounding my rubber soles against the pavement. The alley was empty when I reached it. It ran all the way through to the next street, but I knew that the woman couldn't have reached the other end before I got to this one. I carry a lot of weight these days, but I can still step a block or two in good time. Along both sides of the alley were the rears of apartment buildings, each with its back door looking blankly, secretively at me. The plainclothes man who had been trailing behind me came up, then O'Gar and Thode in their machines, and soon Lusk. O'Gar and Thode rode off immediately to wind through the neighboring streets, hunting for the woman. Lusk and the plainclothes man each planted himself on a corner from which two of the streets enclosing the block could be watched. I went through the alley, hunting vainly for an unlocked door, an open window, a fire escape that would show recent use, any of the signs that a hurried departure from the alley might leave. Nothing. O'Gar came back shortly with some reinforcements from headquarters that he had picked up, and Gatewood. Gatewood was burning. Bungle the damn thing again! I won't pay your agency a nickel, and I'll see that some of those so-called detectives get put back in a uniform and set to walking beats. What did the woman look like? I asked him. I don't know. I thought you were hanging around to take care of her. She was old and bent, kind of, I guess, but I couldn't see her face for her veil. I don't know. What the hell are you men doing? It's a damned outrage the way... I finally got him quieted down and took him home, leaving the city men to keep the neighborhood under surveillance. There was fourteen or fifteen of them on the job now, and every shadow held at least one. The girl would naturally head for home as soon as she was released, and I wanted to be there to pump her. There was an excellent chance of reaching her abductors before they got very far, if she could tell us anything at all about them. Home, Gatewood went up against the whiskey bottle again, while I kept one ear cocked on the telephone and the other at the front door. O'Gar and Thode phoned every half hour to ask if we had heard from the girl. They had still found nothing. At nine o'clock they, with Lusk, arrived at the house. The woman in black had turned out to be a man, and had gotten away. In the rear of one of the apartment buildings that touched the alley, just a foot or so within the back door, they found a woman's skirt, long coat, hat, and veil, all black. Investigating the occupants of the house, they had learned that an apartment had been rented to a young man named Layton three days before. Layton was not at home when they went up to his apartment. His rooms held a lot of cold cigarette butts and an empty bottle, and nothing else that had not been there when he rented it. The inference was clear. He had rented the apartment so that he might have access to the building. Wearing woman's clothes over his own, he had gone out of the back door, leaving it unlatched behind him, to meet Gatewood. Then he had run back into the building, discarded his disguise, and hurried through the building out the front door, and away before we had our feeble net around the block, perhaps dodging into dark doorways here and there to avoid Ogar and Thode in their automobiles. Leighton, it seemed, was a man of about thirty, slender, about five feet eight or nine inches tall, with dark hair and eyes, rather good-looking and well-dressed on the two occasions when people living in the building had seen him, in a brown suit and a light brown felt hat. There was no possibility, according to the opinions of both of the detectives and the post office inspector, that the girl might have been held, even temporarily, in Leighton's apartment. Ten o'clock came, and no word from the girl. Gatewood has lost his domineering bull-headedness by now, and was breaking up. The suspense was getting him, and the liquor he had put away wasn't helping him. I didn't like him either personally or by reputation, but at that I felt sorry for him this morning. I talked to the agency over the phone and got the reports of the operatives who had been looking up Audrey's friends. The last person to see her had been an Agnes Dangerfield, who had seen her walking down Market Street near 6th, alone, on the night of her abduction, sometime between 8.15 and 8.45. Audrey had been too far away for the Dangerfield girl to speak to her. 
For the rest, the boys had learned nothing, except that Audrey was a wild, spoiled youngster who hadn't shown any great care in selecting her friends, just the sort of girl who could easily fall into the hands of a mob of highbinders. Noon struck. No sign of the girl. We told the newspapers to turn loose the story with the added developments of the past few hours. Gatewood was broken. He sat with his head in his hands, looking at nothing. Just before I left to follow a hunch I had, he looked up at me, and I'd never have recognized him if I hadn't seen the change take place. "'What do you think is keeping her away?' he asked. I didn't have the heart to tell him what I was beginning to suspect, not that the money had been paid and she had failed to show up, so I stalled with some vague assurances and left. I caught a streetcar and dropped off down in the shopping district. I visited the five largest department stores, going to all the women's wear departments, from shoes to hats, and trying to learn if a man, perhaps one answering Leighton's description, had been buying clothes that would fit Audrey Gatewood within the last couple of days. Failing to get any results, I turned the rest of the local stores over to one of the boys from the agency, and went across the bay to canvas the Oakland stores. At the first one I got action. A man who might easily have been Leighton had been in the day before, buying clothes that could easily fit Audrey. He had bought lots of them, everything from lingerie to a cloak, and, my luck was hitting on all its cylinders, had had his purchases delivered to T. Offord at an address on 14th Street. At the 14th Street address, an apartment house, I found Mr. and Mrs. Theodore Offord's names under the vestibule telephone for apartment 202. I had just found them, when the front door opened and a stout, middle-aged woman in a gingham house dress came out, she looked at me a bit curiously, so I asked, "'Do you know where I can find a manager?' "'I'm the manager,' she said. I handed her a card and stepped indoors with her. "'I'm from the bonding department of the North American Casualty Company,' a repetition of the lie that was printed on the card I had given her, "'and a bond for Mr. Offord has been applied for. Is he all right, so far as you know?' with a slightly apologetic air of one going through with a necessary but not too important formality. She frowned. A bond? That's funny. He is going away tomorrow. Well, I can't say what the bond is for, I said lightly. We investigators just get the names and the addresses. It may be for his present employer. Or perhaps the man he is going to work for, wherever he's going, has applied for it. Or some firms of us look up prospective employees before they hire them, just to be safe. Mr. Offord, so far as I know, is a very nice young man, she said. But he has been here only a week. Not staying long, then? No. They came here from Denver, intending to stay. But the low altitude doesn't agree with Mrs. Offord, so they are going back. Are you sure they came from Denver? Well, she said, they told me they did. How many of them are there? Only the two of them. They're young people. Well, how do they impress you? I asked, trying to get the impression that I thought her a woman of shrewd judgment over. They seem to be a very nice young couple. You'd hardly know they were in their apartment most of the time. They are so quiet. I'm sorry they can't stay. Do they go out much? I really don't know. They have their keys, and unless I should happen to pass them going in or out, I never see them. That as a matter of fact, you couldn't say whether they stayed away all night some nights or not, could you? She eyed me doubtfully. I was stepping way over my pretext now, but I couldn't think it mattered, and shook her head. No, I couldn't say. They have many visitors? I don't know. Mr. Offord is not— She broke off as a man came in quietly from the street, brushed past me, and started to mount the steps to the second floor. Oh, dear, she whispered. I hope he didn't hear me talking about him. That's Mr. Offord. A slender man in brown with a light brown hat. Leighton, perhaps. I hadn't seen anything of him except his back, nor he anything except mine. I watched him as he climbed the stairs. If he had heard the manager mention his name, he would use the turn at the head of the stairs to sneak a look at me. He did. I kept my face stolid, but I knew him. He was Penny Quail a con man who had been active in the East four or five years before. His face was as expressionless as mine, but he knew me. A door on the second floor shut. I left the manager and started for the stairs. I think I'll go up and talk to him, I told her. Coming silently to the door of apartment 202, I listened. 
not a sound. This was no time for hesitation. I pressed the bell button. As close together as the tapping of three keys under the fingers of an expert typist, but a thousand times more vicious, came three pistol shots, and waist high in the door of apartment 202 were three bullet holes. The three bullets would have been in my fat carcass if I hadn't learned years ago to stand at one side of strange doors when making uninvited calls. Inside the apartment sounded a man's voice, sharp, commanding. Cut it, kid! For God's sake, not that! A woman's voice, shrill, bitter, spiteful, screaming blasphemies. Two more bullets came through the door. Stop! No! No! The man's voice had a note of fear in it now. The woman's voice, cursing hotly. A scuffle. A shot that didn't hit the door. I hurled my foot against the door near the knob, and the lock broke away. On the floor of the room, a man, Quail, and a woman were tussling. He was bending over her, holding her wrists, trying to keep her down. A smoking automatic pistol was in one of her hands. I got to it in a jump and tore it loose. That's enough, I called to them when I was planted. Get up and receive company. Quail released his antagonist's wrists, whereupon she struck at his eyes with curved, sharp-nailed fingers, tearing his cheek open. He scrambled away from her on hands and knees, and both of them got to their feet. He sat down on a chair immediately, panting and wiping his bleeding cheek with a handkerchief. She stood, hands on hips, in the center of the room, glaring at me. "'I suppose,' she spat, "'you think you've raised hell.' I laughed. I could afford to. "'If your father is in his right mind,' I told her, "'he'll do it with a razor strop when he gets you home again. A fine joke you picked out to play on him. If you had been tied to him as long as I have, and had been bullied and held down as much—' I guess you'd do most anything to get enough money so that you could go away and live your own life. I didn't say anything to that. Remembering some of the business methods Harvey Gatewood had used, particularly some of his war contracts that the Department of Justice was still investigating, I suppose the worst that could be said about Audrey was that she was her father's own daughter. How'd you wrap to it? Quayle asked me politely. Several ways, I said. First... I'm a little doubtful about grown persons being kidnapped in cities. Maybe it happens sometimes, but at least nine-tenths of the cases you hear about are fakes. Second, one of Audrey's friends saw her on Market Street between 8.15 and 8.45 the night she disappeared, and your letter to Gatewood was postmarked 9 p.m. Pretty fast work. You should have waited a while before mailing it, even if it had to miss the first morning delivery. I suppose she dropped it in the post office on her way over here. Quayle nodded. Then third, I went on, there was that phone call of hers. She knew it took anywhere from ten to fifteen minutes to get her father on the wire at the office. If time had been as valuable as it would have been if she had gotten to a phone while imprisoned, she'd have told her story to the first person she got a hold of, the phone girl, most likely. So that made it look as if, besides wanting to throw out that Twin Peaks line, she wanted to stir the old man out of his bullheadedness. When she failed to show up after the money was paid, I figured it was a sure bet that she had kidnapped herself. I knew that if she came back home after faking this thing, we'd find it out before we talked to her very long, and I figured she knew that, too, and would stay away. The rest was easy, as I got some good breaks. We knew a man was working with her after we found the woman's clothes you left behind, and I took a chance on there being no one else in it. Then I figured she'd need clothes. She couldn't have taken any from home without tipping her mitt, and there was an even chance that she hadn't laid in a stock beforehand. She'd got too many girlfriends of the sort to do a lot of shopping to make it safe for her to risk showing herself in stores. Maybe then the man would buy what she needed for her, and it turned out that he did, and that he was too lazy to carry away his purchases, or perhaps there was too many of them, and so he had them sent out. That's the story. Quayle nodded again. I was damned careless, he said, and then jerking a contemptuous thumb toward the girl. But what can you expect? She's had a skinful of hop ever since we started. Took all my time and attention, keeping her from running wild and gumming the works. Just now as a sample. I told her you were coming up, and she goes crazy and tries to add your corpse to the wreck. The Gatewood reunion took place in the office of the captain of inspectors on the second floor of Oakland City Hall, and it was a merry little party. For an hour it was a toss-up whether Harvey Gatewood would die of apoplexy, strangle his daughter, or send her off to the state reformatory until she was of age. But Audrey licked him. Besides being a chip off the old block, 
She was young enough to be careless of consequences, while her father, for all his bull-headedness, had some caution hammered into him. The card she beat him with was a threat of spilling everything she knew about him to the newspapers, and at least one of the San Francisco papers had been trying to get his scalp for years. I don't know what she had on him, and I don't think he was any too sure himself, but with his war contracts even then being investigated by the Department of Justice, he couldn't afford to take a chance. There was no doubt at all that she would have done as she threatened. And so, together, they left for home, sweating hate for each other at every pore. We took Quail upstairs and put him in a cell, but he was too experienced to let that worry him. He knew that if the girl was to be spared, he himself couldn't very easily be convicted of anything. Slippery Fingers You are already familiar, of course, with the particulars of my father's, uh, death. The papers are full of it and have been for three days, I said. And I've read them, but I'll have to have the whole story firsthand. There isn't very much to tell. This Frederick Grover was a short, slender man of something under thirty years, and dressed like a picture out of Vanity Fair. His almost girlish features and voice did nothing to make him more impressive, but I began to forget these things after a few minutes. He wasn't a sap. I knew that downtown, where he was rapidly building up a large and lively business in stocks and bonds without calling for too much help from his father's millions, he was considered a shrewd article. And I wasn't surprised later when Benny Foreman, who ought to know, told me that Frederick Grover was the best poker player west of Chicago. He was a cool, well-balanced, quick-thinking little man. Father has lived here alone with the servants since Mother's death two years ago, he went on. I am married, you know, and live in town. Last Saturday evening he dismissed Barton. Barton was his butler valet and had been with father for quite a few years, at a little after nine, saying that he did not want to be disturbed during the evening. Father was here in the library at the time, looking through some papers. The servants' rooms are in the rear, and none of the servants seem to have heard anything during the night. At seven-thirty the following morning, Sunday, Barton found father lying on the floor, just to the right of where you were sitting, dead. "'stabbed in the throat with a brass paper-knife "'that was always kept on the table here. "'The front door was ajar. "'The police found bloody fingerprints on the knife, "'the table, and the front door. "'But so far they have not found the man who left the prints, "'which is why I am employing your agency. "'The physician who came with the police "'placed the time of father's death "'at between eleven o'clock and midnight.' Later, on Monday, we learned that Father had drawn $10,000 in hundred-dollar bills from the bank Saturday morning. No trace of the money has been found. My fingerprints, as well as the servants, were compared with the ones found by the police, but there was no similarity. I think that is all. Do you know of any enemies your father had? He shook his head. I know of none, although he may have had them. You see, I really didn't know my father very well. He was a very reticent man, and until his retirement about five years ago, he spent most of his time in South America, where most of his mining interests were. He may have had dozens of enemies, though Barton, who probably knew more about him than anyone, seems to know of no one who hated father enough to kill him. How about relatives? I was his heir and only child, if that is what you are getting at. So far as I know, he had no other living relatives. I'll talk to the servants. I said. The maid and the cook could tell me nothing, and I learned very little more from Barton. He had been with Henry Grover since 1912, had been with him in Yunnan, Peru, Mexico, and Central America, but apparently he knew little or nothing of his master's business or acquaintances. He said that Grover had not seemed excited or worried on the night of the murder, and that nearly every night Grover dismissed him at about the same time with orders that he not be disturbed so no importance was to be attached to that part of it. He knew of no one with whom Grover had communicated during the day, and he had not seen the money Grover had drawn from the bank. I made a quick inspection of the house and grounds, not expecting to find anything, and I didn't. Half the jobs that come to a private detective were like this one. Three or four days, and often as many weeks, have passed since the crime was committed. 
The police work on the job until they are stumped. Then the injured party calls in a private sleuth, dumps him down on a trail that is old and cold and badly trampled, and expects, Oh, well, I picked out this way of making a living, so... I looked through Grover's papers. He had a safe and desk full of them, but didn't find anything to get excited about. They were mostly columns of figures. I'm going to set an accountant out here to go over your father's books, I told Frederick Grover. Give him everything he asks for and fix it up with a bank so they'll help him. I caught a streetcar and went back to town, called at Ned Root's office, and headed him out toward Grover's. Ned is a human adding machine with educated eyes, ears, and nose. He can spot a kink in a set of books farther than I can see the covers. Keep digging until you find something, Ned, and you can charge Grover whatever you like. Give me something to work on, quick. The murder had all the earmarks of one that had grown out of blackmail, though there was, there always is, a chance that it might have been something else. But it didn't look like the work of an enemy or burglar. Either of them would have packed his weapon with him, would not have trusted to finding it on the grounds. Of course, if Frederick Grover or one of the servants had killed Henry Grover, but the fingerprints said no. Just to play safe, I put in a few hours getting a line on Frederick. He had been at a ball on the night of the murder. He had never, so far as I could learn, quarreled with his father. His father was liberal with him, giving him everything he wanted. And Frederick was taking in more money in his brokerage office than he was spending. No motive for a murder appeared on the surface there. At the city detective bureau, I hunted up the police sleuths who had been assigned to the murder, Marty O'Hara and George Dean. It didn't take them long to tell me what they knew about it. Whoever had made the bloody fingerprints was not known to the police here. They had not found the prints in their files. The classifications had been broadcast to every large city in the country, but with no results so far. A house four blocks from Grover's had been robbed on the night of the murder, and there was a slim chance that the same man might have been responsible for both jobs. But the burglary had occurred after one o'clock in the morning, which made the connection look not so good. A burglar who had killed a man, and perhaps picked up ten thousand dollars on the bargain, wouldn't be likely to turn his hand to another job right away. I looked at the paper knife with which Grover had been killed, and at the photographs of the bloody prints, but they couldn't help me much just now. There seemed to be nothing to do but get out and dig around until I turned up something somewhere. Then the door opened, and Joseph Klain was ushered into the room where O'Hara, Dean, and I were talking. Klain was a hard-bitten citizen for all his prosperous look, fifty or fifty-five, I'd say, with eyes, mouth, and jaw that held plenty of humor, but none of what is sometimes called the milk of human kindness. He was a big man, beefy and all dressed up in a tight-fitting checkered suit, fawn-colored hat, patent leather shoes with buff uppers, and the rest of the things that go with that sort of combination. He had a harsh voice that was as empty of expression as his hard red face, and he held his body stiffly, as if he were afraid the buttons on his too tight clothes were about to pop off. Even his arms hung woodenly at his sides, with thick fingers that were lifelessly motionless. He came right to the point. He had been a friend of the murdered man's, and thought that perhaps what he could tell us would be of value. He had met Henry Grover, he called him Henny, in 1894 in Ontario, where Grover was working a claim, the gold mine that had started the murdered man along the road to wealth. Klain had been employed by Grover as foreman, and the two men had become close friends. A man named Dennis Waldeman had a claim adjoining Grover's, and a dispute had arisen over their boundaries. The dispute ran on for some time, the men coming to blows once or twice. But finally Grover seems to have triumphed, for Waldeman suddenly left the country. Plain's idea was that if we could find Waldeman, we might find Grover's murderer, for considerable money had been involved in the dispute, and Waldeman was a, a mean cuss for a fact, and not likely to have forgotten his defeat. Klain and Grover had kept in touch with each other corresponding or meeting at irregular intervals, but the murdered man had never said or written anything that would throw a light on his death. Klain, too, had given up mining, and now had a small string of racehorses which occupied all his time. He was in the city for a rest between racing meets, had arrived two days before the murder, but had been too busy with his own affairs, he had discharged his trainer and was trying to find another, to call upon his friend. 
Klein was staying at the Marquis Hotel and would be in the city for a week or ten days longer. How come you waited three days before coming to tell us all this? Dean asked him. I wasn't no way sure I had ought to do it. I wasn't ever sure in my mind, but what maybe Henny done for that fellow Waldman? He disappeared sudden-like, and I didn't want to do anything to dirty Henny's name. But finally I decided to do the right thing. And then there's another thing. You found some fingerprints in Henny's house, didn't you? The newspaper said so. We did. Well, I want you to take mine and match them up. I was out with a girl the night of the murder, he leered suddenly boastingly, all night. And she's a good girl, got a husband and lots of folks. But it wouldn't be a right to drag her into this to prove I wasn't in Henny's house when he was killed, in case you maybe think I killed him. So I thought maybe I'd come down here, tell you all about it, and get you to take my fingerprints and have it all over with. We went up to the identification bureau and had Klein's prints taken. They were not at all like the murderers. After we pumped Klein dry, I went out and sent a telegram to our Toronto office asking them to get a line on the Waldeman angle. Then I hunted up a couple of boys who eat, sleep, and breathe horse racing. They told me that Klein was well known in racing circles as the owner of a small string of near horses that ran as irregularly as the stewards would permit. At the Marquis Hotel, I got hold of the house detective, who was a helpful chap, so long as his hand is kept greased. He verified my information about Klein's status in the sporting world, and told me that Klein had stayed at the hotel for several days at a time, off and on, within the past couple of years. He tried to trace Klein's telephone calls for me, but as usual, when you want them, the records were jumbled. I arranged to have the girls on the switchboard listen in on any talking he did during the next few days. Ned Root was waiting for me when I got down to the office the next morning. He had worked on Grover's accounts all night and had found enough to give me a start. Within the past year, that was as far back as Ned had gone, Grover had drawn out of his bank accounts nearly $50,000 that could not be accounted for, nearly 50000 exclusive of the 10000 he had drawn the day of the murder. Ned gave me the amounts and the dates. May 6, 1922, 15000 June 10, 5,000, August 1, 5,000, October 10, 10,000, January 3, 1923, 12,500. 47,500 dollars. Somebody was getting fat off of him. The local managers of the telegraph companies raised the usual howl about respecting their patrons' privacy but I got an order from the prosecuting attorney and put a clerk at work on the files of each office. Then I went back to the Marquis Hotel and looked at the old registers. Klein had been there from May 4th to 7th and from October 8th to 15th last year. That checked off two of the dates upon which Grover had made his withdrawals. I had to wait until nearly 6 o'clock for my information from the telegraph companies, but it was worth waiting for. On the 3rd of last January, Henry Grover had telegraphed $12,500 to Joseph Klein in San Diego. The clerks hadn't found anything on the other dates I had given them, but I wasn't at all dissatisfied. I had Joseph Klein fixed as the man who had been getting fat off Grover. I sent Dick Foley, he is the agency's shadow ace, and Bob Teal, a youngster who will be a world-beater some day, over to Klein's hotel. Plant yourselves in the lobby. I told him. I'll be over in a few minutes to talk to Klein, and I'll try to bring him down in the lobby where you can get a good look at him. Then I want him shadowed until he shows up at police headquarters tomorrow. I want to know where he goes and who he talks to. And if he spends much time talking to any one person, or if their conversation seems very important, I want one of you boys to trail the other man to see who he is and what he does. If Klein tries to blow town, grab him and have him thrown in the can. But I don't think he will. I gave Dick and Bob time enough to get themselves placed, and then went to the hotel. Klein was out, so I waited. He came in a little after eleven, and I went up to his room with him. I didn't ham and haw, but came out cold turkey. All the signs point to Grover's having been blackmailed. Do you know anything about it? No, he said. Grover drew a lot of money out of his banks at different times. You got some of it, I know, and I suppose you got most of it. What about it? He didn't pretend to be insulted or even surprised by my talk. He smiled a little grimly, maybe, but as if he thought it the most natural thing in the world, and it was, at that, for me to suspect him. I told you that me and Henny were pretty chummy, didn't I? We ought to know that all us fellows that fool with the bang tails have our streaks of bad luck. 
Whenever I'd get up against it, I'd hit Penny up for a stake, like at Tijuana last winter when I got into a flock of bad breaks. Henny lent me twelve or fifteen thousand, and I got back on my feet again. I've done that often. He ought to have some of my letters and wires in his stuff. If you look through his things, you'll find them. I didn't pretend that I believed him. Suppose you drop into police headquarters at nine in the morning, and we'll go over everything with the city dicks, I told him. I meant to make my place stronger. I wouldn't make it much later than nine. They might be out looking for you. Ah, uh -huh, was all the answer I got. I got back to the agency and planted myself within reach of a telephone, waiting for word from Dick and Bob. I thought I was sitting pretty. Clayne had been blackmailing Grover. I didn't have a single doubt of that. And I didn't think he'd have been very far away when Grover was killed. That woman alibi of his sounded all wrong. But the bloody fingerprints were not Clayne's. Unless the Police Identification Bureau had pulled an awful boner, and the man who had left the prints was the bird I was setting my cap for, Clayne had let three days pass between the murder and his appearance at headquarters. The natural explanation for that would be that his partner, the actual murderer, had needed nearly that much time to put himself in the clear. My present game was simple. I had stirred Clayne up with the knowledge that he was still suspected, hoping that he would have to repeat whatever precautions were necessary to protect his accomplice in the first place. He had taken three days then. I was giving him about nine hours now. Time enough to do something, but not too much time, hoping that he would have to hurry things along, and that in his haste he would give Dick and Bob a chance to turn up his partner, the owner of the fingers that had smeared blood on the knife, the table, and the door. At a quarter to one in the morning, Dick telephoned that Clayne had left the hotel a few minutes behind me, had gone to an apartment house on Polk Street, and was still there. I went up to Polk Street and joined Dick and Bob, they told me that Clayne had gone in apartment number 27, and that the directory in the vestibule showed this apartment was occupied by George Farr. I stuck around with the boys until two o'clock when I went home for some sleep. At seven I was with him again, and was told that our man had not appeared yet. It was a little after eight when he came out and turned down Geary Street, with the boys trailing him, while I went into the apartment house for a talk with the manager. She told me that Farr had been living there for four or five months, lived alone, and was a photographer by trade with a studio on Market Street. I went up and rang his bell. He was a husky of thirty or thirty-two with bleary eyes that looked as if they hadn't had much sleep that night. I didn't waste any time with him. I'm from the Continental Detective Agency, and I am interested in Joseph Klein. What do you know about him? He was wide awake now. Nothing. Nothing at all? No, sullenly. Do you know him? No. What can you do with a bird like that? Far, I said. I want you to go down to headquarters with me. He moved like a streak, and his sullen manner had me a little off my guard. But I had turned my head in time to take the punch above my ear instead of on the chin. At that, it carried me off my feet, and I wouldn't have bet a nickel that my skull wasn't dented, but luck was with me, and I fell across the doorway, holding the door open, and managed to scramble up, stumble through some rooms, and catch one of his feet as it was going through the bathroom window to join its mate on the fire escape. I got a split lip and a kicked shoulder in the scuffle, but he behaved after a while. I didn't stop to look at his stuff. That could be done more regularly later but put him in a taxicab and took him to the Hall of Justice. I was afraid that if I waited too long, Clayne would take a run out on me. Clayne's mouth fell open when he saw Far, but neither of them said anything. I was feeling pretty chirp in spite of my bruises. Let's get this bird's fingerprints and get it over with, I said to O'Hara. Dean was not in. And keep an eye on Clayne. I think maybe I'll have another story to tell us in a few minutes. We got in the elevator and took our men up to the identification bureau, where we put Farr's fingers on the pad. Fells, he's the department's expert, took one look at the results and turned to me. Well, what of it? What of what, I asked. This isn't the man who killed Henry Grover. Clayne laughed. Farr laughed. O'Hara laughed. And Fells laughed. I didn't. I stood there and pretended to be thinking, trying to get myself in hand. Are you sure you haven't made a mistake? I blurted, my face a nice rosy red. You can tell how badly upset I was by that. It's plain suicide to say a thing like that to a fingerprint expert. Fells didn't answer. He just looked me up and down. 
Clayne laughed again, like a crow cawing, and turned his ugly face to me. Do you want to take my prince again, Mr. Slick Private Detective? Yeah, I said. Just that. I had to say something. Clayne held his hands out to Fells, who ignored them, speaking to me with heavy sarcasm. Better take them yourself this time, so you'll be sure it's done right. I was mad clean through. Of course it was my own fault. But I was pig-headed enough to go through with anything, particularly anything that would hurt somebody's feelings. So I said, that's not a bad idea. I'd walked over and took hold of one of Clayne's hands. I'd never taken a fingerprint before, but I'd seen it done often enough to throw a bluff. I started to ink Clayne's fingers and found that I was holding them wrong. My own fingers were in the way. Then I came back to earth. The balls of Clayne's fingers were too smooth, or rather too slick, without the slight clinging feeling that belongs to flesh. I turned his hands over so fast I nearly upset him and looked at the fingers. I don't know what I expected to find, but I didn't find anything. Not anything that I could name. Fells, I called. Look here. He forgot his injured feelings and bent to look at Clayne's hand. I'll be, he began. And then the two of us were busy for a few minutes, taking Clayne down and sitting on him, while O'Hara quieted Farr, who had also gone suddenly into action. When things were peaceful again, Fells examined Clayne's hands carefully, scratching the fingers with a fingernail. He jumped up, leaving me to hold Clayne and paying no attention to my, What is it? Got a cloth and some liquid and washed the fingers thoroughly. We took his prints again. They matched the bloody ones taken from Grover's house. Then we all sat down and had a nice talk. I told you about the trouble Henny had with that fellow Waldeman, Clayne began after he and Farr had decided to come clean. There was nothing else they could do. And how he won in the argument because Waldeman disappeared? Well, Henny done for him, shot him one night and buried him, and I saw it. Grover was one bad actor in them days, a tough hombre to tangle with, so I didn't try to make nothing out of what I knew. But after he got older and richer, he got soft. A lot of men go like that. Must have been worrying over it, because when I ran into him in New York accidentally about four years ago, it didn't take me long to learn that he was pretty well tamed, and he told me that he hadn't been able to forget the look on Waldeman's face when he drilled him. So I took a chance and braced Henry for a couple thousand. I got them easy, and after that, whenever I was flat, I either went to him or sent him word, and he always came across. But I was careful not to crowd him too far. I knew what a terror he was in the old days, and I didn't want to push him into busting loose again. But that's what I did in the end. I phoned him Friday that I needed money, and he said he'd call me and let me know where to meet him the next night. He called me up about half past nine Saturday night and told me to come out to the house. So I went out there, and he was waiting for me on the porch and took me upstairs and gave me the 10000 I told him that this was the last time I'd ever bother him. I always told him that. It had a good effect on him. Naturally, I wanted to get away as soon as I had the money, but he must have felt sort of talkative for a change, because he kept me there for half an hour or so, gassing about men we used to know up in the province. After a while, I began to get nervous. He was getting a look in his eyes like he used to have when he was young, and then all of a sudden he flared up and tied into me. He had me by the throat and was bending me back across the table when my hand touched that brass knife. It was either me or him. So I let him have it where it could do the most good. I beat it then and went back to the hotel. The newspapers were all full of it next day. Had a whole lot of stuff about bloody fingerprints. That gave me a jolt. I didn't know nothing about fingerprints. And there I'd left them all over the dump. And then I got to worrying over the whole thing, and it seemed like Henny must have had my name written down somewhere as among his papers, and maybe had saved some of my letters or telegrams, though they were written in careful enough language. Anyway, I figured the police would want to be asking me some questions sooner or later, and there I'd be with fingers that fit the bloody prints, and nothing for what Farr calls a alibi. That's when I thought of Farr. I had his address, and I knew he'd been a fingerprint sharp at the East, so I decided to take a chance on him. I went to him and told him the whole story, and between us we figured out what to do. He said he'd dope my fingers, and I was to come here and tell the story we'd fixed up and have my fingerprints taken, and then I'd be safe no matter what leaked out about me and Henny. So he smeared up the fingers and told me to be careful not to shake hands with anybody or touch anything, 
and I came down here and everything went like three of a kind. Then that little fat guy, meaning me, came around to the hotel last night and as good as told me that he thought I had done for Henny and that I'd better come down here this morning. I beat it for Fars right away to see whether I had to run for it or sit tight, and Fars said sit tight. So I stayed there all night, and he fixed up my hands this morning. That's my yarn. Fells turned to Far. I've seen fake prints before, but never any this good. How'd you do it? These scientific birds are funny. Here was Far, looking a nice long stretch in the face as accessory after the fact, and yet he brightened up under the admiration in Fell's tone and answered with a voice that was chock full of pride. It's simple. I got hold of a man whose prints I knew weren't in any police gallery. I didn't want any slip up there, and took his prints and put them on a copper plate using the ordinary photo engraving process, but etching it pretty deep. Then I coated Plain's fingers with gelatin, just enough to cover all his markings, and pressed them against the plates. That way I got everything, even to the pores, and... When I left the bureau ten minutes later, Farr and Fells were still sitting, knee to knee, jabbering away at each other as only a couple of birds who are cuckoo on the same subject can. It. Now listen, Mr. Zumwalt, you're holding out on me and it won't do. If I'm going to work on this for you, I've got to have the whole story. He looked thoughtfully at me for a moment through screwed up blue eyes. Then he got up and went to the door of the outer office, opening it. Past him I could see the bookkeeper and the stenographer sitting at their desks. Tubalt closed the door and returned to his desk, leaning across it to speak in a husky undertone. You are right, I suppose, but what I am going to tell you must be held in the strictest confidence. I nodded, and he went on. About two months ago, one of our clients, Stanley Gorham, turned one hundred thousand dollars worth of liberty bonds over to us. He had to go to the Orient on business, and he had an idea that the bonds might go to par under his absence so he left them with us to be sold if they did. Yesterday I had occasion to go to the safe deposit box where the bonds had been put, in the Golden Gate Trust Company's vault, and they were gone. Anybody except you and your partner have access to the box? No. When did you see the bonds last? They were in the box the Saturday before Dan left, and one of the men on duty in the vault told me that Dan was there the following Monday. All right. Now let me see if I've got it all straight. Your partner, Daniel Rathbone, was supposed to leave for New York on the 27th of last month, Monday, to meet an R.W. Dupuy. But Rathbone came into the office that day with his baggage and said that important personal affairs made it necessary for him to postpone his departure, that he had to be in San Francisco the following morning. But he didn't tell you what that personal business was. You and he had some words over the delay, as you thought it important that he keep the New York engagement on time. You weren't on the best of terms at the time, having quarreled a couple of days before that over a shady deal Rathbone had put over, and so you— Don't misunderstand me, Zumwalt interrupted. Dan had done nothing dishonest. It was simply that he had engineered several transactions that, well, I thought he had sacrificed ethics to profits. I see. Anyhow, starting with your argument over his not leaving for New York that day, you and he wound up by dragging in all of your differences, and practically decided to dissolve partnership as soon as it could be done. The argument was concluded in your house out on 14th Avenue, and as it was rather late by then, and he had checked out of his hotel before he had changed his mind about going to New York, he stayed there with you that night. That's right, Zumwalt explained. I have been living at a hotel since Mrs. Zumwalt has been away, but Dan and I went out to the house because it gave us the utmost privacy for our talk, and when we finished, it was so late that we remained there. Then the next morning you and Rathbone came down to the office, and— No, he corrected me. That is, we didn't come down here together. I came here while Dan went to transact whatever it was that kept him in town. He came into the office a little after noon and said he was going east on the evening train— he sent Quimby, the bookkeeper, down to get his reservations and to check his baggage, which he had left in the office here overnight. Then Dan and I went out to lunch together, came back to the office for a few minutes, he had some mail to sign, and then he left. I see. After that you didn't hear from or of him until about ten days later, when Depoy wired to find out why Rathbone hadn't been to see him. That's right. 
As soon as I got to Poi's wire, I sent one to Dan's brother in Chicago, thinking perhaps Dan had stopped over with him, but Tom wired back that he hadn't seen his brother. Since then, I've had two more wires from Depoy. I was sore with Dan for keeping Depoy waiting, but still I didn't worry a lot. Dan isn't a very reliable person, and if he suddenly took a notion to stop off somewhere between here and New York for a few days, he'd do it. But yesterday, when I found that the bonds were gone from the safe deposit box and learned that Dan had been to the box the day before he left, I decided that I'd have to do something, but I didn't want the police brought into it if it can be avoided. I feel sure that if I can find Dan and talk to him, we can straighten the mess out somehow without scandal. We had our differences, but Dan's too decent a man, and I like him too well, for all his occasional wildness, to want to see him in jail. So I want him found with as much speed and as little noise as possible. Has he got a car? Not now. He had one, but he sold it five or six months ago. Where'd he bank? I mean his personal account. At the Golden Gate Trust Company. Got any photos of him? Yes. He brought out two from a desk drawer. One full face and the other a three-quarter view. They showed a man in the middle of his life with shrewd eyes set together in a hatchet face under dark, thin hair, but the face was rather pleasant for all its craftiness. How about his relatives, friends and so on, particularly his feminine friends? His only relative is the brother in Chicago. As to his friends, he probably had as many as any man in San Francisco. He was a wonderful mixer. Recently, he has been on very good terms with a Mrs. Earnshaw, the wife of a real estate agent. She lives on Pacific Street, I believe. I don't know just how intimate they were, but he used to call her up on the phone frequently, and she called him here nearly every day. Then there is a girl named Eva Duthie, a cabaret entertainer, who lives in the 1100 block of Bush Street. And there were probably others, too, but I know of only those two. Have you looked through his stuff here? Yes but perhaps you'd like to look for yourself. He led me into Rathbone's private office, a small box of a room just large enough for a desk, a filing cabinet, and two chairs, with doors leading into the corridor, the outer office, and zoo vaults. While I'm looking around, you might get me a list of the serial numbers of the missing bonds, I said. They probably won't help us right away, but we can get the Treasury Department to let us know when the coupons come in and from where. I didn't expect to find anything in Rathbone's office, and I didn't. Before I left, I questioned the stenographer and the bookkeeper. They already knew that Rathbone was missing, but they didn't know that the bonds were gone, too. The girl, Mildred Narbert was her name, said that Rathbone had dictated a couple of letters to her on the 28th, the day he left for New York, both of which had to do with the partner's business, and told her to send Quimby to check his baggage and make his reservations. When she returned from lunch, she had typed the two letters and taken them in for him to sign, catching him just as he was about to leave. John Quimby, the bookkeeper, described the baggage he had checked, two large pigskin bags and a cordovan gladstone bag. Having a bookkeeper's mind, he had remembered the numbers of the berth he had secured for Rathbone on the evening train, lower four, car eight. Quimby had returned with the checks and tickets while the partners were out at luncheon and had put them on Rathbone's desk. At Rathbone's hotel, I was told that he had left on the morning of the 27th, giving up his room, but leaving his two trunks there, as he intended living there after his return from New York in three or four weeks. The hotel people could tell me little worth listening to, except that he had left in a taxi cab. At the taxi stand outside, I found the chauffeur who had carried Rathbone. Rathbone? Sure, I know him, he told me around a limp cigarette. Yeah. I guess it was about that date that I took him down to the Golden Gate Trust Company. He had a couple of big yellow bags and a little brown one. He busted into the bank, carrying the little one, and right out again, looking like somebody had kicked him on his corns. Had me take him to the Phelps building. The offices of Rathbone and Zumwalt were in that building. And didn't give me a jit over my fare. At the Golden Gate Trust Company, I had to plead and talk a lot, but they finally gave me what I wanted. Rathbone had drawn out his account a little less than $5,000 on the 26th of the month, the Saturday before he left town. From the trust company, I went down to the ferry building baggage rooms and cigared myself in to a look at the records for the 28th. 
Only one lot of three bags had been checked to New York that day. I telegraphed the numbers and Rathbone's description to the agency's New York office, instructing them to find the bags and, through them, find him. Up in the Pullman Company's offices, I was told that car 8 was the through car, and they could let me know within a couple of hours whether Rathbone had occupied his berth all the way to New York. On my way up to the 1100 block of Bush Street, I left one of Rathbone's photographs with a photographer, with a rush order for a dozen copies. I found Eva Duthie's apartment after about five minutes of searching vestibule directories and got her out of bed. She was an undersized blonde girl of somewhere between 19 and 29, depending upon whether you judge by her eyes or by the rest of her face. I haven't seen or heard from Mr. Rathbone for nearly a month, she said. I called him at his hotel the other night. Had a party I wanted to ring him in on, but they told me he was out of town and wouldn't be back for a week or two. Then in answer to another question. Yes, we were pretty good friends, but not especially thick. You know what I mean? We had a lot of fun together. But neither of us meant anything to the other outside of that. Dan is a good sport, and so am I. Mrs. Earnshaw wasn't so frank, but she had a husband, and that makes a difference. She was a tall, slender woman, as dark as a gypsy, with a haughty air and a nervous trick of chewing her lower lip. We sat in a stiffly furnished room, and she stalled me for about fifteen minutes until I came out flat-footed with her. "'It's like this, Mrs. Earnshaw,' I told her. "'Mr. Rathbone has disappeared, and we are going to find him. You're not helping me.' and you're not helping yourself. I came here to get what you know about him. I could have gone around asking a lot of questions among your friends, and if you don't tell me what I want to know, that's what I'll have to do. And while I'll be as careful as possible, still there's bound to be some curiosity aroused, some wild guesses, and some talk. I'm giving you a chance to avoid all that. It's up to you. You are assuming, she said coldly, that I have something to hide. I'm not assuming anything. I'm hunting for information about Daniel Rathbone. She bit her lip on that for a while, and then the story came out bit by bit, with a lot in it that wasn't any too true, but straight enough in the long run. Stripped of the stuff that wouldn't hold water, it went like this. She and Rathbone had planned to run away together. She had left San Francisco on the 26th, going directly to New Orleans. He was to leave the next day, apparently for New York, but he was to change trains somewhere in the Middle West and meet her in New Orleans. From there they were to go by boat to Central America. She pretended ignorance of his designs upon the bonds. Maybe she hadn't known. Anyhow, she had carried out her part of the plan, but Rathbone had failed to show up in New Orleans. She hadn't shown much care in covering her trail, and private detectives employed by her husband had soon found her. Her husband had arrived in New Orleans, and apparently not knowing that there was another man in the deal, had persuaded her to return home. She wasn't a woman to take kindly to the jilting Rathbone had handed her, so she hadn't tried to get in touch with him or to learn what had kept him from joining her. Her story rang true enough, but just to play safe, I put out a few feelers in the neighborhood, and what I learned seemed to verify what she had told me. I gathered that a few of the neighbors had made guesses that weren't a million miles away from the facts. I got the Pullman Company on the telephone and was told that Lower 4, Car 8, leaving for New York on the 28th, hadn't been occupied at all. Zumbalt was dressing for dinner when I went up to his room at the hotel where he was staying. I told him all that I had learned that day and what I thought of it. Everything makes sense up until Rathbone left the Golden Gate Trust Company vault on the 27th and after that, nothing does. He had planned to grab the bonds and elope with Mrs. Earnshaw, and he had already drawn out of the bank all his own money. That's all orderly. But why should he have gone back to the office? Why should he have stayed in town that night? What was the important business that held him? Why should he have ditched Mrs. Earnshaw? Why didn't he use his reservations at least part of the way across the country as he had planned? False trail, maybe. But a rotten one. There's nothing to do, Mr. Zumwalt, but to call in the police and the newspapers and see what publicity in a nationwide search will do for us. But that means jail for Dan, with no chance to quietly straighten the matter up, he protested. It does. 
but it can't be helped. And remember, you've got to protect yourself. You're his partner. While not criminally responsible, you are financially responsible for his actions. You've got to put yourself in the clear. He nodded reluctant agreement, and I grabbed the telephone. For two hours, I was busy giving all the dope we had to the police, and as much as we wanted published to the newspapers, who luckily had photographs of Rathbone, taken a year before when he had been named his correspondent in a divorce suit. I sent off three telegrams, one to New York, asking that Rathbone's baggage be opened as soon as the necessary authority could be secured. If he hadn't gone to New York, the baggage should be waiting at the station. One to Chicago, asking that Rathbone's brother be interviewed and then shadowed for a few days. And one to New Orleans, to have the city searched for him. Then I headed for home and bed. News was scarce, and the papers the next day had Rathbone spread out all over the front pages, with photographs and descriptions and wild guesses and wilder clues that had materialized somehow within the short space between the time the newspapers got the story and the time they went to press. I spent the morning preparing circulars and plans for having the country covered and arranging to have steamship records searched. Just before noon, a telegram came from New York itemizing the things found in Rathbone's baggage. The contents of the two large bags didn't mean anything. They might have been packed for use or for a stall. But the things in the Gladstone bag, which had been found unlocked, were puzzling. Here's the list. Two suits, silk pajamas, four silk shirts, eight linen collars, four suits underwear, six neckties, six pairs socks, eighteen handkerchiefs, one pair of military brushes, one comb, one safety razor, one tube shaving cream, one shaving brush, one toothbrush, one tube toothpaste, one can talcum powder, one bottle hair tonic, one cigar case holding twelve cigars, one thirty-two Colts revolver, one map of Honduras, one Spanish-English dictionary, two books postage stamps, one pint scotch whiskey, and one manicure set. Zumwalt, his bookkeeper, and his stenographer were watching two men from headquarters search Rathbone's office when I arrived there. After I showed them the telegram, the detectives went back to their examination. What's the significance of that list? Zumwalt asked. It shows there's no sense to the thing the way it now stands, I said. That Gladstone bag was packed to be carried. Checking it was all wrong. It wasn't even locked. And nobody ever checks Gladstone bags filled with toilet articles, so checking it for a stall would have been the bunk. Maybe he checked it as an afterthought to get rid of it when he found he wasn't going to need it. But what could have made it unnecessary to him? Don't forget that it's apparently the same bag he carried into the Golden Gate Trust Company vault when he went for the bonds. Damned if I can dope it. Here's something else for you to dope one of the city detectives said, getting up from his examination of the desk and holding out a sheet of paper. I found it behind one of the drawers where it had slipped down. It was a letter written with blue ink and a firm, angular, and unmistakably feminine hand on heavy white note paper. Dear Danny Boy, if it isn't too late, I've changed my mind about going. If you can wait another day until Tuesday, I'll go. Call me up as soon as you get this, and if you still want me, I'll pick you up in the Roadster at the Shattuck Avenue Station, Tuesday afternoon. More than ever yours, Boots. It was dated the 26th, the Sunday before Rathbone had disappeared. That's the thing that made him lay over another day and made him change his plans, one of the police detectives said. I guess we'd better run over to Berkeley and see what we can find at the Shattuck Avenue Station. Mr. Zumwalt, I said when he and I were alone in his office. How about this stenog of yours? He bounced up from his chair, and his face turned red. What about her? Is she... How friendly was she with Rathbone? Miss Narbit, he said heavily, deliberately, as if to be sure that I caught every syllable, is to be married to me as soon as my wife gets her divorce. That is why I canceled the order to sell my house. Now, would you mind telling me just why you asked? Just a random guess, I lied, trying to soothe him. I don't want to overlook any bets, but now that's out of the way. It is, he was still talking deliberately, and it seems to me that most of your guesses have been random ones. 
If you will have your office send me a bill for your services to date, I think I can dispense with your help. Just as you say. But you'll have to pay for a full day today, so if you don't mind, I'll keep on working at it till night. Very well. But I am busy, and you needn't bother about coming in with any reports. All right, I said and bowed myself out of the office, but not out of the job. That letter from Boots had not been in the desk when I searched it. I had taken every drawer out and even tilted the desk to look under it. The letter was a plant. And then again, maybe Zumwalt had given me the air because he was dissatisfied with the work I had done and peeved at my question about the girl, and maybe not. Suppose, I thought, walking up Market Street, bumping shoulders and stepping on people's feet, the two partners were in this thing together. One of them would have to be the goat, and that part had fallen to Rathbone. Zumwalt's manner and actions since his partner's disappearance fit that theory well enough. Employing a private detective before calling in the police was a good play. In the first place, it gave him the appearance of innocence. Then the private sleuth would tell him everything he learned, every step he took, giving Zumwalt an opportunity to correct any mistakes or oversights in the partner's plans before the police came into it, and if the private detective got on dangerous ground, he could be called off. And suppose Rathbone was found in some city where he was unknown, and that would be where he'd go. Zumwalt would volunteer to go forward to identify him. He would look at him and say, No, that's not him. Rathbone would be turned loose, and that would be the end of that trail. This theory left the sudden change in Rathbone's plans unaccounted for, but it made his return to the office on the afternoon of the 27th more plausible. He had come back to confer with his partner over that unknown necessity for the change, and they had decided to leave Mrs. Earnshaw out of it. Then they had gone to Zumwalt's house. For what? And why had Zumwalt decided not to sell the house? And why had he taken the trouble to give me an explanation? Could they have cashed the blondes there? A look at the house wouldn't be a bad idea. I telephoned Bennett at the Oakland Police Department. Do me a favor, Frank. Call Zumwalt on the phone. Tell him you've picked up a man who answers Rathbone's description to a T, and ask him to come over and take a look at him. When he gets there, stall him as long as you can, pretending the man is being fingerprinted and measured or something like that, and then tell him you've found the man isn't Rathbone and that you're sorry to have brought him over there and so on. If you only hold him for half or three-quarters of an hour, it will be enough. It will take him more than half an hour traveling each way. Thanks. I stopped in at the office, stuck a flashlight in my pocket, and headed for 14th Avenue. Zumwalt's house was a two-story, semi-detached one, and the lock on the front door held me up about four minutes. A burglar would have gone through it without checking his stride. This breaking into the house wasn't exactly according to the rules, but on the other hand, I was legally Zumwalt's agent until I discontinued work that night, so this crashing in wouldn't be considered illegal. I started at the top floor and worked down. Bureaus, dressers, tables, desks, chairs, walls, woodwork, pictures, carpets, plumbing. I looked at everything that was thick enough to hold paper. I didn't take things apart, but it's surprising how speedily and how thoroughly you can go through a house when you're in training. I found nothing in the house itself, so I went down into the cellar. It was a large cellar and divided in two. The front part was paved with cement and held a full coal bin, some furniture, some canned goods, and a lot of odds and ends of housekeeping accessories. The rear division, behind a plaster partition where the steps ran down from the kitchen, was without windows and illuminated only by one swinging electric light, which I turned on. A pile of lumber filled half the space. On the other side, barrels and boxes were piled up to the ceiling, Two sacks of cement lay beside them, and in another corner was a tangle of broken furniture. The floor was of hard dirt. I turned to the lumber pile first. I wasn't in love with the job ahead of me, moving the pile away and then back again, but I needn't have worried. A board rattled behind me, and I wheeled to see Zumbald rising from behind a barrel and scowling at me over a black automatic pistol. Put your hands up, he said. I put them up. I didn't have a pistol with me, not being in the habit of carrying one, except when I thought I was going to need it. 
but it would have been all the same if I'd had a pocket full of them. I don't mind taking chances, but there's no chance when you're looking into the muzzle of a gun that a determined man is holding on you. So I put my hands up, and one of them brushed against the swinging light globe. I drove my knuckles into it. As the cellar went black, I threw myself backward into one side. Zumwalt's gun streaked fire. Nothing happened for a while. I found that I had fallen across the doorway that gave to the stairs in the front cellar. I figured that I couldn't move without making a noise that it would draw lead, so I lay still. Then began a game that made up in tenseness what it lacked in action. The part of the cellar where we were was about twenty by twenty feet and blacker than a new shoe. There were two doors. One on the opposite side opened to the yard and was, I suppose, locked. I was lying on my back across the other, waiting for a pair of legs to grab. Zumwalt, with a gun out of which only one bullet had been spent, was somewhere in the blackness, and aware, from his silence, that I was still alive. I figured I had the edge on him. I was closest to the only practicable exit. He didn't know that I was unarmed. He didn't know whether I had help close by or not. Time was valuable to him, but not necessarily so to me, so I waited. Time passed. How much, I don't know. Maybe half an hour. The floor was damp and hard and thoroughly uncomfortable. The electric light had cut my hand where I broke it, and I couldn't determine how badly I was bleeding. I thought of Tad's blind men in a dark room hunting for a black hat that wasn't there, and knew how he felt. A boxer barrel fell over with a crash, knocked over by Zumwalt, no doubt, moving out from the hiding place wherein he had awaited my arrival. Silence for a while. And then I could hear him moving cautiously off to one side. Without warning, two streaks from his pistol sent bullets into the partition somewhere above my feet. I wasn't the only one who was feeling the strain. Silence again, and I found that I was wet and dripping with perspiration. Then I could hear his breathing, but I couldn't determine whether he was nearer or was breathing more heavily. A soft sliding dragging across the dirt floor. I pictured him crawling awkwardly on his knees in one hand, the other hand holding the pistol out ahead of him, the pistol that would spit fire as soon as its muzzle touched something soft, and I became uneasily aware of my bulk. I am thick through the waist, and there in the dark it seemed to me that my paunch must extend almost to the ceiling, a target that no bullet could miss. I stretched my hands out toward him and held them there. If they touched him first, I'd have a chance. He was panting harshly now, and I was breathing through a mouth that was stretched as wide as it would go, so there would be no rasping of the large quantities of air I was taking in and letting out. Abruptly he came. Hair brushed the fingers of my left hand. I closed them about it, pulling the head I couldn't see viciously toward me, driving my right fist beneath it. You may know that I put everything I had on that smack when I tell you that not until later, when I found that one of my cheeks was scorched, did I know that his gun had gone off. He wiggled and I hit him again. Then I was sitting astride him, my flashlight hunting for his pistol. I found it and yanked him to his feet. As soon as his head cleared, I herded him into the front cellar and got a globe to replace the one I had smashed. Now dig it up, I ordered. That was a safe way of putting it. I wasn't sure what I wanted or where it would be, except that his selecting this part of the cellar to wait for me in made it look as if this was the right place. You'll do your own digging he growled. Maybe, I said, but I'm going to do it now, and I haven't time to tie you up. So if I've got to do the digging, I'm going to crown you first, so you'll sleep peacefully until it's all over. All smeared with blood and dirt and sweat, I must have looked capable of anything, for when I took a step toward him, he gave in. From behind the lumber pile he brought a spade, moved some of the barrels to one side, and started turning up the dirt. When a hand, a man's hand, dead yellow where the damp dirt didn't stick to it, came into sight, I stopped him. I had found it, and I had no stomach for looking at it after three weeks of lying in the wet ground. Note. In court, Lester Zumwalt's plea was that he had killed his partner in self-defense. Zumwalt testified that he had taken the Gorham bonds in a futile attempt to recover losses in the stock market, and that when Rathbone, who had intended taking them and going to Central America with Mrs. Earnshaw, had visited the safe deposit box and found them gone, he had returned to the office and charged Zumwalt with the theft. 
Zumwalt at that time had not suspected his partner's own dishonest plans and had promised to restore the bonds. They had gone to Zumwalt's house to discuss the matter, and Rathbone, dissatisfied with his partner's plan of restitution, had attacked Zumwalt and had been killed in the ensuing struggle. Then Zumwalt had told Mildred Narbet, his stenographer, the entire story and had persuaded her to help him. Between them they had made it appear that Rathbone had been in the office for a while the next day, the 28th, and had left for New York. However, the jury seemed to think that Zumwalt had lured his partner out to the 14th Avenue house for the purpose of killing him, so Zumwalt was found guilty of murder in the first degree. The first jury, before which Mildred Narbet was tried, disagreed. The second jury acquitted her, holding that there was nothing to show that she had taken part in either the theft of the bonds or the murder, or that she had had any knowledge of either crime until afterward, and that her later complicity was, in view of her love for Zumwalt, not altogether blameworthy. Bodies Piled Up the Montgomery Hotel's regular detective had taken his last week's rake-off from the hotel bootlegger in merchandise instead of cash, had drunk it down, had fallen asleep in the lobby, and been fired. I happened to be the only idle operative in the Continental Detective Agency's San Francisco branch at the time, and thus it came about that I had three days of hotel coppering while a man was being found to take the job permanently. The Montgomery is a quiet hotel of the better sort, and so I had a very restful time of it. Until the third and last day. Then things changed. I came down into the lobby that afternoon to find Stacy, the assistant manager on duty at the time, hunting for me. One of the maids just phoned that there's something wrong up in 906, he said. We went up to that room together. The door was open. In the center of the floor stood a maid, staring goggle-eyed at the closed door of the clothes press. From under it, extending perhaps a foot across the floor toward us, was a snake-shaped ribbon of blood. I stepped past the maid and tried the door. It was unlocked. I opened it. Slowly, rigidly, a man pitched out into my arms, pitched out backward, and there was a six-inch slit down the back of his coat and the coat was wet and sticky. That wasn't altogether a surprise. The blood on the floor had prepared me for something of the sort. But when another followed him, facing me, this one, with a dark, distorted face, I dropped the one I had caught and jumped back. And as I jumped, a third man came tumbling out after the others. From behind me came a scream and a thud as the maid fainted. I wasn't feeling any too steady myself. I'm no sensitive plant, and I've looked at a lot of unlovely sights in my time, but for weeks afterward I could see those three dead men coming out of that clothes-press to pile up at my feet, coming out slowly, almost deliberately, in a ghastly game of follow your leader. Seeing them, you couldn't doubt that they were really dead. Every detail of their falling, every detail of the heap in which they now lay, had a horrible certainty of lifelessness in it. I turned to Stacy, who, deathly white himself, was keeping on his feet only by clinging to the foot of the brass bed. Get the woman out! Get doctors! Police! I pulled the three dead bodies apart, laying them out in a grim row, faces up. Then I made a hasty examination of the room. A soft hat, which fitted one of the dead men, lay in the center of the unruffled bed. The room key was in the door, on the inside. There was no blood in the room except what had leaked out of the clothes press, and the room showed no signs of having been the scene of a struggle. The door to the bathroom was open. In the bottom of the bathtub was a shattered gin bottle, which from the strength of the odor and the dampness of the tub had been nearly full when broken. In one corner of the bathroom I found a small whiskey glass, and another under the tub. Both were dry, clean, and odorless. The inside of the clothes-press door was stained with blood from the height of my shoulder to the floor, and two hats lay in the puddle of blood on the closet floor. Each of the hats fitted one of the dead men. That was all. Three dead men, a broken gin bottle, blood. Stacy returned presently with a doctor, and while the doctor was examining the dead men, the police detectives arrived. The doctor's work was soon done. This man, 
he said, pointing to one of them, was struck on the back of the head with a small blunt instrument, and then strangled. This one, pointing to another, was simply strangled, and the third was stabbed in the back with a blade perhaps five inches long. They have been dead for about two hours, since noon or a little after. The assistant manager identified two of the bodies. The man who had been stabbed, the first to fall out of the clothes press, had arrived at the hotel three days before, registering as Tudor Ingraham of Washington, D.C., and it occupied room 915, three doors away. The last man to fall out, the one who had been simply choked, was the occupant of this room. His name was Vincent Devlin. He was an insurance broker and had made the hotel his home since his wife's death some four years before. The third man had been seen in Devlin's company frequently, and one of the clerks remembered that they had come into the hotel together at about five minutes after twelve this day. Cards and letters in his pockets told us that he was Homer Ansley, a member of the law firm of Lancashire and Ansley, whose offices were in the Miles Building, next door to Devlin's office, in fact. Devlin's pockets held between $150 and $200. Ansley's wallet contained more than $100. Ingraham's pockets yielded nearly $300, and in a money belt around his waist we found $2,200 and two medium-sized unset diamonds. All three had watches, Devlin's was a valuable one, in their pockets, and Ingraham wore two rings, both of which were expensive ones. Ingraham's room key was in his pocket. Beyond this money, whose presence would seem to indicate that robbery hadn't been the motive behind the three killings, we found nothing on any of their persons to throw the slightest light on the crime. Nor did the most thorough examination of both Ingram's and Devlin's rooms teach us anything. In Ingram's room, we found a dozen or more packs of carefully marked cards, some crooked dice, and an immense amount of data on racehorses. Also, we found that he had a wife who lived on East Delavan Avenue in Buffalo and a brother on Cruncher Street in Dallas, as well as a list of names and addresses that we carried off to investigate later, but nothing in either room pointed even indirectly at murder. Fells, the police department Bertillion man, found a number of fingerprints in Devlin's room, but we couldn't tell whether they would be of any value or not until he had worked them up. Though Devlin and Ansley had apparently been strangled by hands, Fells was unable to get prints from either their necks or their collars. The maid who discovered the blood said that she had straightened up Devlin's room between 10 and 11 that morning, but had not put fresh towels in the bathroom. It was for this purpose that she had gone to the room in the afternoon. She had found the door unlocked, with a key on the inside, and as soon as she entered, had seen the blood and telephoned Stacy. She had seen no one in the corridor nearby as she entered the room. She had straightened up Ingraham's room, she said, at a few minutes after one. She had gone there earlier, between 10.20 and 10.45, for that purpose, but Ingraham had not then left it. The elevator man who had carried Ansley and Devlin up from the lobby at a few minutes after twelve remembered that they had been laughingly discussing their golf scores of the previous day during the ride, no one had seen anything suspicious at the hotel around the time in which the doctor had placed the murders, but that was to be expected. The murderer could have left the room, closing the door behind him, and walked away, secure in the knowledge that at noon a man in the corridors of the Montgomery would attract little attention. If he was staying at the hotel, he would simply have gone to his room. If not, he would have either walked all the way down to the street, or down a floor or two, and then caught an elevator. None of the hotel employees had ever seen Ingraham and Devlin together. There was nothing to show that they had even the slightest acquaintance. Ingraham habitually stayed in his room until noon, and did not return to it until very late at night. Nothing was known of his affairs. At the Miles Building, we, that is, Marty O'Hara and George Dean of the Police Department Homicide Detail, and I, questioned Ansley's partner and Devlin's employees. Both Devlin and Ansley, it seemed, were ordinary men who lived ordinary lives, lives that held neither dark spots nor queer kinks. Ansley was married and had two children. He lived on Lake Street. Both men had a sprinkling of relatives and friends scattered here and there through the country, and so far as we could learn, their affairs were in perfect order. They had left their offices this day to go to luncheon together, 
intending to visit Devlin's room first for a drink apiece from a bottle of gin someone coming from Australia had smuggled into him. Well, O'Hara said when we were on the street again, this much is clear. If they went up to Devlin's room for a drink, it's a cinch that they were killed almost as soon as they got in the room. Those whiskey glasses you found were dry and clear. Whoever turned the trick must have been waiting for them. I wonder about this fellow, Ingraham. I'm wondering, too, I said, figuring it out from the positions I found them in when I opened the closet door. Ingraham sizes up as the key to this whole thing. Devlin was back against the wall, with Ansley in front of him, both facing the door. Ingraham was facing them, with his back to the door. This close press was just large enough for them to be packed in it, too small for any of them to slip down while the door was closed. Then there was no blood in the room except what had come from the clothes press. Ingram, with that gaping slit in his back, couldn't have been stabbed until he was inside the closet, or he'd have bled elsewhere. He was standing close to the other men when he was knifed, and whoever knifed him closed the door quickly afterward. Now why should he have been standing in such a position? Do you dope it out that he and another killed a, two friends, and that while he was stowing their bodies in the closet, his accomplice finished him off? Maybe, Dean said, and that maybe was still as far as we had gone three days later. We had sent and received bales of telegrams, having relatives and acquaintances of the dead man interviewed, and we had found nothing that seemed to have any bearing upon their deaths, nor had we found the slightest connecting link between Ingraham and the other two. We had traced those other two back step by step almost to their cradles. We had accounted for every minute of their time since Ingraham had arrived in San Francisco, thoroughly enough to convince us that neither of them had met Ingraham. Ingraham, we had learned, was a bookmaker, an all-around crooked gambler. His wife and he had separated, but were on good terms. Some fifteen years before, he had been convicted of assault with intent to kill in Newark, New Jersey, and had served two years in the state prison. But the man he had assaulted, one John Pellow, had died of pneumonia in Omaha in 1914. Ingraham had come to San Francisco for the purpose of opening a gambling club, and all our investigations had tended to show that his activities while in the city had been toward that end alone. The fingerprints Fells had secured had all turned out to belong to Stacy, the maid, the police detectives, or myself. In short, we had found nothing. So much for our attempts to learn the motive behind the three murders. We now dropped that angle and settled down to the detail-studying, patience-taxing grind of picking up the murderer's trail. From any crime to its author, there is a trail. It may be, as in this case, obscure. But since matter cannot move without disturbing other matter along its path, there always is there must be a trail of some sort, and finding and following such trails is what a detective is paid to do. In the case of a murder, it is possible sometimes to take a shortcut to the end of the trail by first finding the motive. A knowledge of the motive often reduces the field of possibilities, sometimes points directly to the guilty one. It is on this account that murderers are, as a rule, more easily apprehended than any other class of criminals. But a knowledge of the motive isn't indispensable. Quite a few murder mysteries are solved without its help, and in a fair proportion, say 10 to 20 percent of cases where men are convicted justly of murder, the motive isn't clearly shown even at the last, and sometimes is hardly guessed at. So far, all we knew about the motive in the particular case we were dealing with was that it hadn't been robbery, unless something we didn't know about had been stolen something of sufficient value to make the murderer scorn the money in his victim's pockets. We hadn't altogether neglected the search for the murderer's trail, of course, but being human, we had devoted most of our attention to trying to find a shortcut. Now we set out to find our man, or men, regardless of what had urged him or them to commit the crimes. Of the people who had been registered at the hotel on the day of the killing, there were nine men of whose innocence we hadn't found a reasonable amount of proof. Four of these were still at the hotel, and only one of that four interested us very strongly. That one, a big raw-boned man of forty-five or fifty, who had registered as J.J. J. Cooper of Anaconda, Montana, wasn't, we had definitely established, really a mining man, as he pretended to be. 
and our telegraphic communications with Anaconda failed to show that he was known there. Therefore, we were having him shadowed, with few results. Five men of the nine had departed since the murders, three of them leaving forwarding addresses with a mail clerk. Gilbert Jacquemart had occupied room 946 and had ordered his mail forwarded to him at a Los Angeles hotel. W.F. Salway, who had occupied room 1022, had given instructions that his mail be readdressed to a number on Clark Street in Chicago. Ross Orrett, room 609, had asked to have his mail sent to him care of general delivery at the local post office. Jacques Mart had arrived at the hotel two days before and had left on the afternoon of the murders. Salway had arrived the day before the murders and had left the day after them. Or it had arrived on the day of the murders and had left the following day. Sending telegrams to have the first two found and investigated, I went after Orit myself. A musical comedy named What For, as being widely advertised just then with gaily printed plum-colored handbills, I got one of them, and at a stationery store an envelope to match, and mailed it to Orit at the Montgomery Hotel. There are concerns that make a practice of securing the names of arrivals at the principal hotels and mailing them advertisements. I trusted that Orit, knowing this, wouldn't be suspicious when my gaudy envelope, forwarded from the hotel, reached him through the general delivery window. Dick Foley, the agency's shadow specialist, planted himself in the post office to loiter about with an eye on the O window until he saw my plum-colored envelope passed out, and then to shadow the receiver. I spent the next day trying to solve the mysterious J.J. J. Cooper's game, but he was still a puzzle when I knocked off that night. At a little before five the following morning, Dick Foley dropped into my room on his way home to wake me up and tell me what he had done for himself. This ore baby is our meat, he said. Picked him up when he got his mail yesterday afternoon. Got another letter besides yours. Got an apartment on Van Ness Avenue. Took it the day after the killing under the name of B.T. Quinn. Packing a gun under his left arm. There's that sort of bulge there. Just went home to bed. Been visiting all the dives in North Beach. Who do you think he's hunting for? Who? Guy Kudner. That was news. This Guy Kudner, alias the Dark Man, was the most dangerous bird on the coast, if not in the country. He had only been nailed once, but if he had been convicted of all the crimes that everybody knew he had committed, he'd have needed half a dozen lives to crowd his sentences into, besides another half dozen to carry to the gallows. However, he had decidedly the right sort of backing, enough to buy him everything he needed in the way of witnesses, alibis, even juries, and so the talk went, an occasional judge. I don't know what went wrong with his support that one time he was convicted up north and sent over for a one to fourteen year hitch, but it adjusted itself promptly, for the ink was hardly dry on the press notices of his conviction before he was loose again on parole. Is Cudner in town? Don't know, Dick said. But this Orrit, or Quinn, or whatever his name is, is surely hunting for him in Rick's place, at Wap Healy's, and at Pagatti's. Porky Grout tipped me off, says Orrit doesn't know Cudner by sight, but is trying to find him. Porky didn't know what he wants with him. This Porky Grout was a dirty little rat who would sell out his family, if he ever had one, for the price of a flop. But with these lads who play both sides of the game, it's always a question of which side they're playing when you think they're playing yours. Think Porky was coming clean? I asked. Chances are, but you can't gamble on him. Is Orrit acquainted here? Doesn't seem to be. Knows where he wants to go, but has to ask how to get there. Hasn't spoken to anybody that seemed to know him. What's he like? Not the kind of egg you want to tangle with offhand, if you ask me. He and Cudner would make a good pair. They don't look alike. This egg is tall and slim, but he's built right. Those fast, smooth muscles. Face is sharp without being thin, if you get me. I mean all the lines in it are straight. No curves. Chin, nose, mouth, eyes, all straight, sharp lines and angles. Looks like the kind of egg we know Cudner is. Make a good pair. Dresses well and doesn't look like a rowdy, but harder than hell. A big game hunter. Our meat, I bet you. It doesn't look bad, I agreed. He came to the hotel the morning of the day the men were killed and checked out the next morning. 
He packs a rod and changed his name after he left, and now he's paired off with a dark man. It doesn't look bad at all. I'm telling you, Dick said, this fellow looks like three killings wouldn't disturb his rest any. I wonder where Kudner fits in. I can't guess, but if he and Oren haven't connected yet, then Kudner wasn't in on the murders. But he may give us the answer. Then I jumped out of bed. I'm going to gamble on Porky's dope being on the level. How would you describe Kudner? You know him better than I do. Yes, but how would you describe him to me if I didn't know him? A little fat guy with a red fork scar on his left cheek. What's the idea? It's a good one, I admitted. That scar makes all the difference in the world. If he didn't have it and you were to describe him, you'd go into all the details of his appearance. But he has it, so you simply say, a little fat guy with a red forked scar on his left cheek. It's a ten to one that that's just how he has been described or it. I don't look like Kudner, but I'm his size and build, and with a scar on my face, or it will fall for me. What then? There's no telling, but I ought to be able to learn a lot if I can get Orrit talking to me as Kudner. It's worth a try, anyway. You can't get away with it. Not in San Francisco. Kudner's too well known. What difference does that make, Dick? Orrit is the only one I want to fool. If he takes me for Kudner, well and good. If he doesn't, still well and good. I won't force myself on him. How are you going to fake the scar? Easy. We have pictures of Kudner showing the scar in the criminal gallery. I'll get some collodion. It's sold in drug stores under several trade names for putting on cuts and scratches. Color it and imitate Kudner's scar on my cheek. It dries with a shiny surface and put on thick will stand out just enough to look like an old scar. It was a little after eleven the following night when Dick telephoned me that Orrit was in Pagotti's place on Pacific Street and apparently settled there for some little while. My scar already painted on, I jumped into a taxi and within a few minutes was talking to Dick around the corner from Pagotti's. He's sitting at the last table back on the left side, and he was alone when I came out. You can't miss him. He's the only egg in the joint with a clean collar. You better stick outside, half a block or so away with the taxi, I told Dick. Maybe Brother Orrit and I will leave together, and I'd just as leave have you standing by in case things break wrong. Pagotti's place is a long, narrow, low-ceilinged cellar, always dim with smoke. Down the middle runs a narrow strip of bare floor for dancing. The rest of the floor is covered with closely packed tables, whose cloths are always soiled, and the management hasn't yet verified the rumor that the country has gone dry. Most of the tables were occupied when I came in, and half a dozen couples were dancing. Few of the faces to be seen were strangers to the morning lineup at police headquarters. Peering through the smoke, I saw Orrit at once, seated alone in a far corner, looking at the dancers with the set blank face of one who masks an all-seeing watchfulness. I walked down the other side of the room and crossed the strip of dance floor directly under a light so that the scar might be clearly visible to him. Then I selected a vacant table not far from his and sat down facing him. Ten minutes passed while he pretended an interest in the dancers, and I affected a thoughtful stare at the dirty cloth on my table, but neither of us missed so much as a flicker of the other's lids. His eyes, gray eyes that were pale without being shallow, with black needlepoint pupils, met mine after a while in a cold, steady, inscrutable stare, and very slowly he got to his feet. One hand, his right, in a side pocket of his dark coat, he walked straight across to my table and sat down opposite me. Kudner, Looking for me, I hear, I replied, trying to match the icy smoothness of his voice as I was matching the steadiness of his gaze. He had sat down with his left side turned slightly toward me, which put his right arm in not too cramped a position for straight shooting from the pocket that still held his hand. You were looking for me, too. I didn't know what the correct answer to that would be, so I just grinned. But the grin didn't come from my heart. I had, I realized, made a mistake, one that might cost me something before we were done. This bird wasn't hunting for Kudner as a friend, as I had carelessly assumed, but was on the warpath. I saw those three dead men falling out of the closet in room 906. My gun was inside the waistband of my trousers, where I could get it quickly, but his was in his hand. 
so I was careful to keep my own hands motionless on the edge of the table while I widened my grin. His eyes were changing now, and the more I looked at them, the less I liked them. The gray in them had darkened and grown duller, and the pupils were larger, and white crescents were showing beneath the gray. Twice before I had looked into eyes such as these, and I hadn't forgotten what they meant, the eyes of the congenital killer. Suppose you speak your piece, I suggested after a while. But he wasn't to be beguiled into conversation. He shook his head a mere fraction of an inch, and the corners of his compressed mouth dropped down a trifle. The white crescents of eyeballs were growing broader, pushing the gray circles up under the upper lids. It was coming, and there was no use waiting for it. I drove a foot at his shins under the table, and at the same time pushed the table into his lap and threw myself across it. The bullet from his gun went off to one side. Another bullet, not from his gun, thudded into the table that was upended between us. I had him by the shoulders when the second shot from behind took him in the left arm, just below my hand. I let go then and fell away, rolling over against the wall and twisting around to face the direction from which the bullets were coming. I twisted around just in time to see, jerking out of sight behind a corner of the passage that gave to a small dining room, Guy Kudner's scarred face and as it disappeared, a bullet from Orrit's gun splattered the plaster from the wall where it had been. I grinned at the thought of what must be going on in Orrit's head as he lay sprawled out on the floor, confronted by two Cudners, but he took a shot at me just then, and I stopped grinning. Luckily, he had to twist around to fire at me, putting his weight on his wounded arm, and the pain made him wince, spoiling his aim. Before he had adjusted himself more comfortably, I had scrambled on hands and knees to Bacotti's kitchen door, only a few feet away, and had myself safely tucked out of range behind an angle in the wall, all but my eyes and the top of my head, which I risked now so that I might see what went on. Or it was now ten or twelve feet from me, lying flat on the floor, facing Kudner with a gun in his hand and another on the floor beside him. Across the room, perhaps thirty feet away, Kudner was showing himself around his protecting corner at brief intervals to exchange shots with a man on the floor, occasionally sending one my way. We had the place to ourselves. There were four exits, and the rest of Pagotti's customers had used them all. I had my gun out, but I was playing a waiting game. Kudner, I figured, had been tipped off to Orit's search for him, and had arrived on the scene with no mistaken idea of the other's attitude. Just what there was between them, and what bearing it had on the Montgomery murders, was a mystery to me, but I didn't try to solve it now. I kept away from the bullets that were flying around as best I could and waited. They were firing in unison. Kudner would show around his corner, both men's weapons would spit, and he would duck out of sight again. Or it was bleeding about the head now, and one of his legs sprawled crookedly behind him. I couldn't determine whether Kudner had been hit or not. Each had fired eight or perhaps nine shots when Kudner suddenly jumped out into full view, pumping his gun in his left hand as fast as its mechanism would go, the gun in his right hand hanging at his side. Or it had changed guns and was on his knees now, his fresh weapon keeping pace with his enemies. That couldn't last. Kudner dropped his left-hand gun, and as he raised the other, he sagged forward and went down on one knee. Or it stopped firing abruptly and fell over on his back, spread out full length. Kudner fired once more, wildly, into the ceiling, and pitched down on his face. I sprang to Orit's side and kicked both of his guns away. He was lying still, but his eyes were open. "'Are you, Kudner? Oh, is he?' "'He? Bud,' he said, and closed his eyes. I crossed to where Kudner lay and turned him over on his back. His chest was literally shot to pieces. His thick lips worked, and I put my ear down to them. I got him. Yes, I lied. He's already cold. His dying face twisted into a triumphant grin. Sorry. Three in hotel. He gasped hoarsely. Mistake. Wrong room. Got one. Had to. Other two. Protect myself. I... He shuddered and died. A week later, the hospital people let me talk to Orit. I told him what Kudner had said before he died. That's the way I doped it out, or it said from another the depths of the bandages in which he was swathed. That's why I moved and changed my name the next day. I suppose you've got it nearly figured out by now, he said after a while. No, I confessed, I haven't. I have an idea what it was all about, 
but I could stand having a few details cleared up. I'm sorry I can't clear them up for you, but I got to cover myself up. I'll tell you a story, though, and it may help you. Once upon a time there was a high-class crook, what the newspapers call a mastermind. Came a day when he found he had accumulated enough money to give up the game and settle down as an honest man. But he had two lieutenants, one in New York and one in San Francisco, and they were the only men in the world who knew he was a crook. And besides that, he was afraid of both of them, so he thought he'd rest easier if they were out of the way. And it happened that neither of these lieutenants had ever seen the other. So this mastermind convinced each of them that the other was double-crossing him and would have to be bumped off for the safety of all concerned, and both of them fell for it. The New Yorker went to San Francisco to get the other, and the San Franciscan was told that the New Yorker would arrive on such and such a day and would stay at such and such a hotel. The mastermind figured out there was an even chance of both men passing out when they met, and he was nearly right at that, but he was sure that one would die, and then, even if the other missed hanging, there would be only one man left for him to dispose of later. There weren't as many details in the story as I would like to have, but it explained a lot. How do you figure out Kudner's getting into the wrong room? I asked. <laughs> that was funny. Maybe it happened like this. My room was 609, and the killing was done in 906. Suppose Kudner went to the hotel on the day he knew I was due and took a quick slant at the register. He wouldn't want to be seen looking at it if he could avoid it, and so he didn't turn it around, but flashed a look at it as it lay, facing the desk. When you read numbers of three figures upside down, you have to transpose them in your head to get them straight, like one, two, three. You'd get that three, two, one, and then turn them around in your head. That's what Kudner did with mine. He was keyed up, of course, thinking of the job ahead of him, and he overlooked the fact that 609 upside down still reads 609 just the same. So he turned it around and made it 906. Devlin's room. That's how I doped it, I said, and I reckon it's about right. And then he looked at the key rack and saw that 906 wasn't there. So he thought he might just as well get his job done right then, when he could roam the hotel corridors without attracting attention. Of course, he may have gone up to the room before Ansley and Devlin came in and waited for them, but I doubt it. I think it more likely that he simply happened to arrive at the hotel a few minutes after they had come in. Ansley was probably alone in the room when Kudner opened the unlocked door and came in, Devlin being in the bathroom getting the glasses. Ansley was about your size and age, and close enough in appearance to fit a rough description of you. Kudner went for him, and then Devlin, hearing the scuffle, dropped the bottle and glasses and rushed out and got his. Kudner, being the sort he was, would figure that two murders were no worse than one, and he wouldn't want to leave any witnesses around. Then that is probably how Ingram got into it. He was passing on his way from his room to the elevator and perhaps heard the racket and investigated, and Kudner put a gun in his face and made him stow the two bodies in the clothes press, and then he stuck his knife in Ingram's back and slammed the door on him. That's about the... An indignant nurse descended on me from behind and ordered me out of the room, accusing me of getting her patient excited. Or it stopped me as I turned to go. Keep your eye on the New York dispatches, he said and maybe you'll get the rest of the story. It's not over yet. Nobody has anything on me out here. The shooting in Pagatti's was self-defense, as far as I'm concerned, and as soon as I'm on my feet again and could get back east, there's going to be a mastermind holding a lot of lead. That's a promise. I believed him. <laughs>